Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, October 21st uh, Board of Directors Dr. Cog meeting. Uh, I will call to order the meeting at 6.30 p.m. The next item, roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Before we get to roll call, uh, I'd like to recognize a few, um, a few new members. Uh, Mayor Roy Palmer from the town of Columbine Valley. Uh, welcome, Mayor Palmer. And uh, Larry Vidim from the town of Bennett. You are a returning board member. Doesn't feel like you left, Larry, but uh, again, welcome back. And uh, Ms. Stevens, a uh, roll call, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I am going to open up the lines for everyone. Uh, just make sure that your microphone is green when you intend to speak. And here we go. Oh, and anyone on the phones, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay, here we go. Eva Henry. Jeff Baker. Present. Welcome back, Larry. <laughs> Elise Joe. William Lindstedt. George Martin. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Laura Thomas. Here. Oh, there we go. Ron Angles, Libby Davo, Casey Ty. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Libby. <clears throat> Bob Pfeiffer, Mike Kaufman, Allison Coombs, David Spellman, Larry Ditto. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margo Ramson. Adam Cushing. Present. Deborah Mulvey. Present. George Teal. Here. Tammy Maurer. Roy Palmer. Jeremy Fay. Randy Wheel. Happy to be here. <laughs> Happy to have you. Nicole Frank. Craig Hurst. Catherine Whitman. I am here. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, uh, Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Here. Bill Gipp. Okay, Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Don Cognac, David Whelan, Josie Cockrell. Here. Lynette, oh, thank you, Josie. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Rachel Binkley. Jim Dale. Paul Hassman, <clears throat> George Lance, Dave Kerber, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Hi. Uh, Jacob LeBure, sure. Karina Elrod, Pamela Grove. Larry Strock. Present. Wynn Shaw. Here. Joan Peck. Marsha Martin. Here. Oh, there we go. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Nicholas Angelo. Holly Rogen. Colleen Whitlow. David Adams, Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Christopher Larson, here, Julie Duran Mullica, Joyce Downing, Sally Daigle, 
Dave Black, Clint Folsom, Jessica Sandgren. Here. Herb Atchison. Yes. Bud Starker. Rebecca Present. White. Oh, thank you, Bud. Rebecca White. Adam Zarin. And Bill Van Meter. Okay, and uh, just in case I missed anyone, if you want to state your name for the record really fast. Elise Jones is here. Thank you, Elise. Okay, and with Thank that. Hello. And Tammy okay. Mauer is here. Thank you, Tammy. Appreciate that. Yeah, Bob Pfeiffer's here. Somebody's controlling my microphone. Thank you, Bob. Uh, oh, and I see a hand up from Bill Gipp. Yes. So, there we go. Thank you, Bill. All right. And I think with that, uh, I will turn it back to our chair and we do have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stevens. And, and again, for any of you that may have had audio difficulty or we just didn't get to you, uh, staff will monitor the attendance list and uh, make note of your attendance. Uh, with that, item three, uh, I would like a motion to approve the agenda. If anybody would like to do so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have anybody who would like to make a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, yes, we do. It looks like uh, I have a hand raised from Kevin Flynn, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Melinda. I move, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the agenda for this evening. All right. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, may I have a second? Please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Uh, yes, I, I believe we have a second from Director Peck. Director Peck, go ahead. I second the motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, with a motion and a second, Ms. Stevens, can you please open the phone so we can have our first vote of the night? Absolutely. Okay. We should be all right. Uh, um, motion to approve. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Against. Abstain. Motion carries unanimously. We have a we have an agenda. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next part of the agenda: strategic informational briefing. Uh, item four: the Colorado greenhouse gas pollution reduction road map recommendations. I would like to turn this item over to Executive Director Rex. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And um, it's a great honor this evening to have uh, have Will Tor. Uh, here he's the executive director of the of the Colorado Energy Office, but more importantly, he's Dr. Cog family. He was, uh, as many of you know, he was a uh, former former uh, Boulder council member, former Boulder commissioner, I believe, and most importantly, he was former Dr. Cog board chair, and he was the recipient of our most prestigious award, the John B. Christensen Award, which uh, celebrates uh, regionalism. So, sir, we're so very appreciative to have you here this evening. Um, the board board may notice that we didn't we don't have any action items this evening and typically we would have probably um canceled this meeting but um because of the time sensitivity of this presentation um we felt it was important to get it in front of everyone now and i'm so appreciative for for for, for mr tor being able to um come tonight and give the presentation so without any further ado uh will i'll turn it to you great thank you very much doug and it's great to be able to uh Join Dr. Cog again. I spent 15 years as a board member, and it it's great to be able to be back at least virtually with uh, discussion with the board. So I am going to uh, give an overview of the roadmap uh, to address climate change and reduce uh, greenhouse gas pollution, with a particular focus on the transportation-related policies, since those are probably of greatest interest and most relevant, and um, are folks able to see the presentation? Not no. yet. Soon. <clears throat> Let's see. How about now? <clears throat> yep. No. Okay. This my computer claims that it is being shown. <laughs> there we go. There it is. <laughs> there it is. <clears throat> Great. So but just as you know, as background in terms of the the administration's perspective on this, 
know, Governor Polis ran in 2018 on a, a platform that focused on early childhood education, reducing the cost of health care, tax reform and economic development, and uh, moving towards 100 renewal, percent like, renewable electricity generation and bold climate action. Um, over the last two years, there has been, you know, substantial progress that it, that has been made. And in, in 2019, the legislature, depending exactly how you count it, uh, passed between 14 and 16 pieces of significant legislation on clean energy, climate, energy efficiency, and transportation electrification. Um, notably, House Bill 1261. <laughs> Uh, for the first time set science-based targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions for the state uh, with a target of a 26 percent reduction by 2025 below 2005 levels 50 percent by 2030 and 90 percent by 2050. in addition uh, senate bill 236 was a very sort of comprehensive modernization of our statutes for electric utilities that did many things, uh, but among them creating strong incentives for utilities to uh, reduce pollution. And um, at the expectation is that utilities that represent over 95% of the fossil generation in the state will be adopting plans to reduce emissions by 80% or more by 2030. And certainly over the last uh, 12 months, we have actually seen a sort of major announcements from Tri-State, Colorado Springs Utilities, and the Platte River Power Association, all of which are retiring all of their coal generation within the state and replacing it primarily with new wind and solar. There's been significant advances on uh, zero emission vehicles, including the adoption of the zero emission vehicle rule in 2019, making the state the first state in a, a decade to adopt as a requirement, and the first one ever to do so with the support of the automobile industry. Uh, the rule that was adopted was actually jointly submitted by CDOT, the Energy Office, and the two associations that represent 99% of auto manufacturing within the, the United States, or 99% of auto sales within the United States as manufacturers. Um, recently, in in uh, July, the state signed on to a multi-state memorandum of understanding with 14 other states to advance the market for zero emission medium duty vehicles, trucks and buses, and launched a stakeholder uh, process in cooperation with the Colorado Motor Carriers Association to develop a, a broad clean trucking strategy for, for Colorado. On the oil and gas front, Senate Bill 181 in addition to uh, the many other things that it does that are largely in the purview of the Oil and Gas Commission, I've directed the Air Commission to uh, take action to further reduce methane emissions as well as volatile organic compound emissions from, from the oil and gas sector. Won't run through, through all of this, but you just would, would want to say that while we've been working on developing the roadmap, there's also been substantial work uh, moving forward in multiple agencies to make you know, immediate progress on reducing emissions. Um, I would note uh, the creation of the Office of Just Transition uh, pursuant to legislation in 2019 that is focused on uh, assuring that there is a just transition for coal workers and for the communities that are dependent uh, historically uh, upon uh, coal mining and coal generation, and there is a draft plan that's been released and will be finalized uh, this fall. Um, the GHG roadmap itself is, is designed to be essentially a strategic plan for how do we move forward to achieve the targets that were adopted by the legislature. After those bills were signed in the spring of 2019, Governor Polis uh, charged five agencies to work together with CO in a coordinating role. So the Energy Office, CDOT, the Department of Public Health and Environment, the Department of Natural Resources, and the Department of Agriculture were, were the agencies working uh, together to develop the roadmap. We launched the process in late fall 2019, um, brought a 
technical consultant, E3 or energy and environmental economics on, on board to assist with the um, modeling and scenario development and with the greenhouse gas inventories. And then there's been substantial public public engagement with you know, multiple meetings with targeted stakeholders and multiple public meetings through, throughout the last year. On September 30th, uh, we published a public comment draft of the, the full roadmap, including the uh, inventory, the scenario modeling, key findings, and probably most important, recommendations on early actions to make progress towards the 2025 and 2030 goals that would inform the administration's sort of regulatory and legislative agenda as we move into 2021. The roadmap a public comment period, uh, we, were, we were asking for comments by November 1st, but have received requests from a number of primarily local government uh, organizations that felt that their schedules made it difficult to provide comments by then. So we have extended the deadline to November 12th. We will begin incorporating feedback um, after the first and are encouraging folks to get feedback in by then if possible but we will be able to consider comments received through the 12th. Um, a, number, a number of things that we saw early on in the, in the roadmap process. Um, first is that there are a wide variety of sources of greenhouse gas emissions, but there are four that really stand out as uh, the dominant sources. Electrical generation has historically been the largest source, but is actually now the second largest source because it is cleaning up more rapidly than any other sector. Transportation has now moved from second to first as our largest single source of, of emissions in the state, um, followed by emissions associated with the oil and gas industry. Uh, some of those are, are shown in brown here and some in green. And then emissions associated with buildings, in particular, you know, space heating and water heating and buildings are the fourth largest source. When we looked at where we're, you know, where are we today? Where are we headed? And are we, are we going to achieve the goals? Uh, we modeled three different scenarios. The top or blue line is a reference scenario reflecting where we were headed prior to the 2019 legislative session. The brown line in the middle that we're calling the 2019 action scenario. Uh, today is essentially the business as usual scenario. It's where um, we think we are headed into the future given the uh, policies that were adopted in 2019 and some reasonable assumptions about how they'll be implemented. And then the red line is uh, the science-based targets adopted by the legislature. And what we see is that we're making some real progress, that we are on a, a trajectory towards lower levels of pollution. Um, but that it that there's still a significant gap between the um, the level of emissions reduction that we're projecting under the 2019 action scenario and what's required. We we basically get about half the level of emissions reductions uh, that are required in 2025 and 2030. So some good news that we're trending in the right direction, uh, but there's definitely more that is going to need to be done in order to to protect our future by meeting meeting these targets. Um, looking out through through 2030, on a number of things that stand out as key areas to work on. Um, first is continuing the swift transition to renewable electric generation. You know, continuing to to move towards uh, retiring uh, generally expensive and uneconomic coal plants and replacing them with what is now the cheapest source of power. Of wind and solar uh, will account for a large fraction of the emissions reductions, but in 2025 and 2030. Uh, the second largest fraction, sort of shown in that brown wedge, is what is uh, possible by reducing methane leaks in the oil and gas industry. And then there are a whole bunch of things that we will need to do in, in other sectors to get a, a bunch of smaller wedges. Um, those include accelerating the transition to electric vehicles and um, making sure that our approaches to transportation planning and infrastructure can um, reduce the growth in vehicle miles traveled that we've historically seen. 
and have certainly seen uh, up until this year um, in you know, the last five or so years since about 2015, um, as well as really accelerating improvements to both building energy efficiency and electrification of buildings. I know that both of those, we see relatively small emissions reductions in the first few years because it takes a long time for stock to turn over. You know, this has to happen on the time scale of people and businesses uh, retiring their vehicles and buying new trucks and buses and cars in the time frame of you know, people doing major remodels to buildings and re retiring uh, appliances and replacing them with new heaters. And so you see it starting relatively small, but it grows over time. And certainly as you look out past 2030, we need to be on a trajectory towards deep reductions in uh, transportation and buildings in order to achieve these targets. Um, as we look out to 2050, uh, what really stands out is the, the level of um, transformation that's going to be required in essentially every sector that involves energy use. That while out to 2030, the, the focus can you know, primarily be in a, in a handful of sectors, that we are going to need to achieve 90% plus emissions reductions from electricity generation, industry, buildings, transportation, and the oil and gas industry, in addition to smaller but still meaningful reductions from non-energy sources such as agriculture um, and emissions from things like landfills and sewage treatment plants. The primary focus of the roadmap is on the 2025 and 2030 target, since that's where current policy can have the, the greatest impact. Uh, but we certainly think it's important to uh, lay out the, the issues that are going to need to be addressed in order to reach the longer term targets. Um, in terms of the perhaps the meatiest part of the, the roadmap is a set of recommendations on near term action. And I will run through these at a very high level and then uh, delve a, a, in a little more depth into the recommended transportation strategies. Um, first on electricity, again, this is the sector where we think we are in the best shape. We are on a tra trajectory towards uh, deep uh, emissions reductions in the electricity sector. We have tools at the Public Utilities Commission and the Air Quality Control Commission involving adoption of clean energy plans and memorializing um, coal plant retirements that have been um, voluntarily announced by utilities, essentially locking those in through things like the regional haze rulemaking at the Air Commission. And we think that we really are on a pathway to that 80% emission reduction, but are also recommending that we consider additional mechanisms to incentivize uh, deeper reductions. We know that for at least some utilities, they can actually go beyond 80%. Platte River Power Association, you know, the municipal utility serving four cities in Northern Colorado, is actually in the process of adopting a plan that will achieve 90% or greater emissions reductions by 2030. Um, within transportation, you know, there's the, the largest number of strategies recommended here that I think reflects both the fact that it's the largest source of emissions and that it's a sector that unlike electricity, where you have just a handful of utilities that can you know, change direction, that transportation, you know, really involves, again, the decisions of millions of individuals and businesses on how they're going to get around and what vehicles they're going to purchase. And it really needs a, a comprehensive approach in, in order to, to make progress here. The first recommendation is creating greenhouse gas emission pollution standards for uh, transportation plans. The idea here would be to do something somewhat similar to what we currently do in the non-attainment area for um, pollutants like ozone precursors and carbon monoxide, where there is an analysis of essentially of what's, what's possible in terms uh, of reducing emissions over time that's used to set um, emissions budgets. And then the transportation, in the transportation planning process, both you know, the DOT and MPOs like Dr. Cog within the non-attainment area you know, do modeling of the emissions that would be associated with those plans 
and you know the the plans have to to live within those emissions budgets. So the real concept here would be to to expand that from traditional criteria pollutants to also include greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a second recommendation is is the adoption of trip reduction or transportation demand requirements for large employers, particular focus on encouraging telecommuting, seeing the you know what we've all learned over the last few months about about the re remarkable levels of telecommuting that many businesses can sustain while, while still being uh, very productive. Um, I, I would note that this is something that within the non-attainment area will likely be required under federal law if if the region is bumped up to severe non-attainment status for ozone, um, we would actually have to to adopt it. But the the concept here would would be to be looking at the greenhouse gas emissions benefits, not just ozone benefits. Um, the clean trucking strategy I, I mentioned. Um, we think that there's real opportunity here uh, to be looking at multiple elements of of uh, moving medium and heavy duty vehicles towards lower emissions. And the, the stakeholder uh, process is looking uh, both at opportunities uh, in the near term for replacing some of the dirtiest trucks on the road with things like cleaner di diesel and natural gas vehicles, but also with a, a real focus on looking at how do we start transitioning the fleet towards zero emissions. There are certain sectors like you know, medium duty delivery trucks where, and transit buses where uh, the vehicles are available or will be available very soon on the market. We, we keep seeing, for instance, major announcements from co companies like Amazon about their moving forward with Rivian on the medium uh, duty electrified trucks. Um, but we would be looking at both uh, the infrastructure investments re required, um, what type of incentives may be may be needed for fleet adoption and regulatory elements to, such as potential adoption of the advanced clean truck standard, which is an analogy to the zero emission vehicle standard, but for heavy duty vehicles. Um, revenue, I know, you know, transportation funding has for many years been near and dear to the, the heart of uh, Dr. Cog. And I think we all know that there have been ongoing discussions about how to generate uh, additional revenue for investment in transportation infrastructure. Uh, part of our recommendation is that any rev revenue mechanism that moves forward on transportation um, should include uh, funding to uh, assist with that transition to low and zero emissions cars, trucks, and buses. Um, another one that I think is you know, very uh, connected to um, the interests of MPOs is recognizing the role that land use decisions by local governments have on development patterns that can either, you know, support higher VMT and greater levels uh, of pollution, or um, lower VMT and lower levels of pollution, and in many cases, greater access to housing near jobs. You know, the the concept here I think is very much. The type of approach that Dr. Cog has taken through uh, Metro Vision and to to think about how the the state uh, can support encouraging local governments to to really pursue um, land use decisions that that are in the broader public interest. Another recommendation is to consider indirect source standards. This is a tool under the Clean Air Act uh, that can require certain types of new development to help offset the emissions impacts of that development. And the roadmap also uh, recognizes the, the importance of giving people options and in particular expansion of public transit, including setting the stage for Front Range Rail. The other things I'll run through very quickly here, there's a, a wide set of recommendations focused on buildings and natural gas utilities, really focused on um, improving energy efficiency, um, starting to set carbon reduction goals for our natural gas utilities, similar to the, the goals that have been set for our electric utilities, um, looking at uh, benchmarking and performance standards for large uh, commercial buildings, and 
uh, having our utilities expand the programs that they currently offer for energy efficiency for their customers to also support electrification by their customers. Things like adoption of high efficiency electric heat pumps and electric heat pump water heaters. Um, on oil and gas, the, I, I mentioned that we think that there's opportunities for deep emissions reductions in methane emissions from the upstream and midstream oil and gas industry. Uh, what we are recommending is that in 2021, the Air Quality Control Commission undertake a, a rulemaking that would target at least a 33% industry-wide emission reduction by 2025 and 50% by 2030. This is really based on, upon the fact that many of the major producers have uh, made clear that they believe that they can achieve um, very significant reductions in uh, their leak rates. And this would be taking those goals and starting to, to build them into the regulatory arena. Uh, we anticipate that a stakeholder process will be initiated in the near future to, to begin development of that rule. Um, again, there, there are also recommendations on industry, agriculture, natural and working lands, um, and, and waste. Uh, the one that I would mention that may be of particular interest to, to local governments is that we are looking at the, the potential of creating market incentives for renewable natural gas and that there could be some real opportunities for both sewage treatment plants and landfills to expand their capture of methane. Um, diving into the transportation side, you know, first I want to note that the electric transportation really relies upon um, the fact that electricity is cleaning up so rapidly. And if you look at the, the graph on the left here, uh, what you're what you see is that the black shows the uh, coal generation, the gray shows uh, natural gas generation, and the blue and then orange are showing wind and solar. And uh, what you see is that we are on a trajectory uh, towards you know, virtually no coal generation uh, a decade out from now, and about two thirds of the generation being renewable. And again, gets us to about an 80% emission reduction. And remarkably, the because there has been so much both business model innovation and technical innovation and learning by doing in the uh, utility industry on utility scale renewables, we are now in a world where the cost of solar and wind is not only um, lower than the cost of other forms of new generation, but in fact, it is cheaper to build new wind and solar than it is to simply operate um, existing coal plants. Uh, Tri-state generation, our second largest utility in the state that serves most of the rural co-ops and has committed to repairing all of their coal plants in Colorado and New Mexico over the next generation. Uh, just, their, their board just adopted a a plan to reduce the rates by 8% over the next few years. Um, and their their CEO, Dwayne Hiley, describes it as the green dividend from replacing expensive coal with cheap wind and solar. Um, but what this also does is dramatically magnifies the, the benefits of electrifying buildings and transportation. Um, what we saw in the, the transportation modeling is that in order to achieve the kinds of emissions targets, that uh, the, the state has adopted, that basically by 2050, we need to be at close to 100% uh, of um, light duty vehicles being zero emission vehicles of one sort or another. And that, that likely means that by about 2040, uh, we need to uh, be at close to 100% uh, market share for new vehicle sales. So, you know, right now we're at three to four percent, so very significant growth that is needed over the next two decades. Um, a, few, a few slides here to describing it in, in a little more depth the recommended transportation strategies. Um, again, the, the language in the roadmap is establishing greenhouse gas emissions budgets for the large capacity projects and the overall um, transportation plans, 
and starting to uh, include the social cost of carbon in benefit cost analyses and transportation. Uh, this is already done in the utility sector. Senate Bill 236 um, required that all utility cost benefit analyses going forward incorporate the social cost of, of carbon. And it basically allows us to understand the, the impacts of decisions better and you know, make, make better decisions by understanding all of those costs. Um, trip reduction, TDM requirements. Again, I think everyone in Dr. Cog is very um, familiar with, with TDM. We think that this could be an important um, strategy for reducing VMT. And again, this is one which early in the development of the roadmap was probably lower down on the priority list. But you know, given, given the experience over the last few months uh, with telecommuting, I think we're we're now seeking that the the scale of long-term impact from employer-based trip reduction programs that include a focus in telecommuting really could be quite meaningful. Um, the clean trucking strategy, as as I noted, we've kicked off a stakeholder engagement process in July. We've also uh, just kicked off an in-depth technical analysis that MJ Bradley will be um, conducting for for the state to, to inform the decision-making going forward. And again, we wanted to make sure that in the development of the strategy, working with stakeholders, that we, we weren't prejudging the outcome and would be looking at a wide variety, sort of an all of the above uh, approach, at least at the, the start as we consider strategies for reducing emissions. Um, in a, a few of the ones that I would highlight here, you know, the third one down here incorporated clean technologies into key freight corridors. I think it's really an opportunity for, for CDOT as they are developing uh, corridor projects to really think through what they can do to make sure that there's a necessary infrastructure for clean trucks going forward. The We, we think that there are significant opportunities in working with the state fleet and other public fleets to, to support cleaner fleets, in addition to working with a, again, a bunch of the individual companies that, out there, that are out there that are very interested in moving to cleaner fleets. You know, I, I mentioned Amazon. Um, I would note that Walmart has major commitments to uh, moving towards um, cleaner trucks. And in fact, they're, they're engaged supporting electric vehicle investments by Excel right now. So we think a lot of opportunities with fleet. Um, and again, I won't run through through all of these, uh, but over the next few months, we'll be finalizing, I think, a, a set of recommendations on the clean truck strategy. And probably by the end of the, the year, we'd be certainly making, making decisions on the regulatory side. Uh, public investment, you know, Again, we think that the level of funding that's going to be needed to support the transition to that vehicles, uh, both for infrastructure and for fleet incentives, uh, is unlikely to be available through the general fund, and that we need to be looking at revenue mechanisms that are sustained and long term and that are bondable so that there's the opportunity to um, do significant infrastructure investments in the near term, and that this could either be a standalone clean transportation measure or probably makes more sense to be part of any broader transportation funding package that might move forward. Um, land use planning and incentives, you know, this is probably one of the ones that is, is least uh, well developed in terms of details. I think that we would very much want to work with key stakeholders, uh, including local governments and MPOs, to think through how the, the state can support uh, smart land use decisions by local governments that can can both increase equity, increase access to, you know, from housing to jobs, but also have that effect of helping to reduce energy use and emissions. Um, indirect source standards. So the idea here is that again, there are certain types of land use, such as new warehouses or industrial um, sites, that can be major generators of emissions that don't come directly from the building, but come from trips associated with, say, heavy truck traffic. And for 
you know, for those projects, indirect source rules can supplement um, land use authority to ensure that the impacts are evaluated and mitigated. And so, for instance, there could be requirements that if you're doing a large new warehouse that has very high emissions associated with it, you know, maybe there are requirements that you're looking at zero emission vehicle infrastructure or that there, there is support for transitioning a, a portion of that fleet to cleaner vehicles over time. And again, probably not a, a lot that I need to say to this group about the, the importance of expanding uh, public transit, uh, looking both at things like rail, but also at bus rapid transit uh, along congested corridors. Um, I'll throw it open to, to questions now. I just want to sort of leave you with this slide that describes uh, where to go to provide formal written input. Uh, if you go to the Energy Office website, there is a section for the GHG roadmap and there's an opportunity to provide comments through the web portal or you can email comments directly to climatechange at state.co.us. Um, I would also note that in addition to the, the roadmap process, you know, the Air Quality Control Commission is very much in, engaged in the development of greenhouse gas strategy and that you can um, get on the Air Pollution Control Division um, email update list if you're, you're interested in you know, being kept up to date on the Air Commission's uh, actions in this arena. But note that, in fact, this Friday, there, there will be an Air Commission meeting that will be focusing on sort of next steps on, on greenhouse gas emissions for anyone who's interested in a, a real deep dive on it. And with that, I will throw it open to questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Executive Director Tour. Uh, board members, if you have any questions, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Uh, Ms. Stevens, I will hand it to you to uh, navigate through those questions and comments, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from Joan Peck. So Director Peck, go ahead and unmute yourself and you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Will Tour, for uh, this comprehensive update of the plan, of the energy plan. Um, I can tell you've done a lot of work and I really appreciate it. I have a question for you um, and then a comment. Um, my first question is, uh, PRPA is looking to build a rice plant or a reciprocating internal combustion engine plant for natural gas, um, supposedly for a backup in case our renewable energy source fails through uh, the dark night, dark days. What is your what is your opinion about using those dollars, which will come to uh, millions and millions of dollars to build this plant? versus investing that money in green energy locally, either through more solar units and battery storage or wind power? This is so, just an question. Yep, yeah, no, great question. And um, the Energy Office and the Department of Public Health and Environment actually provided some formal comment to the PRPA board on this. Um, okay. Our, you know, I would say first our, our perspective is that you know PRPA under either one of the scenarios under consideration you know to achieve 90% or close to 100% emission reduction would be you know exceeding the the state's um, essentially regulatory requirement. It's more for Excel it's a requirement for others. It's strongly incentivized of an 80% emission reduction, mm -hmm. um, and in fact would be the Either either one would be the mo most ambitious level of emissions reduction of any utility plan in the state. Um, we do think that you know while the governor has a goal of 100% renewables by by 2040, that in in the nearer term there's still some technical innovation that's going to be required to get from you know 80 or 90% up to a 100% precisely because of that issue of things like long dark calm periods in in the winter and that in order to maintain reliability and affordability 
that some form of firm generation for backup is needed. Um, okay. Our recommendation to the PRPA board was that we were comfortable with them adopting a, a plan that would achieve a 90% emission reduction that would include a, a rice unit out in the future, but that before actually uh, building such a unit, I think it would be really important to assess the current state of technology and things like long duration storage and assess to, to what extent we have been successful in potentially moving into bigger regional markets that allow more, more flexibility and the ability to cost effectively integrate renewables from far away. Um, so that that would be important before actually committing to, to the actual construction of a rice unit. And that if they do move forward on construction of a rice unit, would be important to understand that its lifetime would probably be much shorter than the technical lifetime uh, because of the need to to move to zero emissions. So that it would be important to amortize the, the costs over a, a short time period because I think it's very unlikely that you would still have something like that operating in 2040. Right. Okay. Thank you. That really that really made a lot of sense to me. So the other thing that I would like to mention is uh, thank you very much for including the Front Range Rail in your list of next actions needed. Um, but I was surprised about the bullet point um, about looking for revenue you had on electric cars, uh, buses, et cetera, but you did not put a rail on there. Um, for future revenue sources, uh, why why is that? Um, so that was not uh, in that bullet point. Yeah. Um, so so great point. Uh, that that bullet point was really focused on you know, the fact that historically transportation investment at a variety of levels in the state has has focused on more traditional investment that includes you know public transit bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure and highway infrastructure. And we were trying to um, make the point that we also need to be investing in zero emission infrastructure. You know, that it was not intended to, to suggest that we don't need revenue for public transit. Mm -hmm, because that is a huge part of public transit, especially if we invest in electric or uh, battery operated engines, which have become very popular. I just, uh, as you know, I'm going to keep pushing the uh, the public transit multimodal option of, of rail as as part of our whole package of transportation. So thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, uh, Director Peck. It looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Larry Vidum. So Director Vidum, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Uh, first of all, thank you for a, a fascinating uh, presentation. The one thing that uh, sort of troubled me is about about three or four months ago, I read a, I read a report that said at the current time, 100% of the energy produced in the United States requires one half of 1% of the dry surface of the lower 48 states. And that is what I would call the whole enchilada, oil, gas, coal, uh, nuclear, hydro, uh, uh, wind, solar, the whole kit and caboodle. The same article said if the United States ever uh, had 100% of its energy production from wind and solar, as apparently uh, the governor suggests with his uh, 2040 plan, that it would require a minimum of 46% of the land area to a maximum of 53% of the land area. So that implies to me that uh, such a plan would require deforestation and a reduction of the food supply as a result of taking uh, ag land out of service. And I wondered if you uh, have any thoughts on that matter. Yeah, no, that's a great question. No, I, I think I would start by saying it, it certainly is the case that if you look at the amount of land needed for renewables compared to the amount of land uh, needed for you know, fossil generation, it does. It is a larger land footprint. I'm I'm not familiar with the particular article you were reading, but I 
those numbers, you know, based on all the analysis that we have seen and and engaged in, you know, are are far higher than what I we would anticipate the actual numbers to be. That we wouldn't be talking, you know, anywhere like 40 or 50 percent, but instead of, uh, but we certainly would be talking higher higher levels of. Uh, of land that would be be needed for renewables. There's a lot of things that I think can be done to to address that. You know, first, I would note that we we've already made you know, major steps forward to, towards uh, re renewables in the state, and have not had major land use conflicts over that. Uh, what we've seen is is that uh, wind farms in particular have been very compatible with agricultural activity in uh, the eastern part of, of the state and you know, it's certainly very compatible with grazing. Uh, we are seeing really interesting developments happening with what are known as agrovoltaics. Uh, one of the, the leading projects actually is outside of Longmont. So a research collaboration between the National Renewable Energy Lab and a solar garden developer, uh, where they are uh, developing um, solar farms where the placement, the, the height of placement and the angle of placement of the panels is such as to be very compatible with agricultural activities. And then there, there are certainly many opportunities with things like uh, rooftop solar that can actually play a significant role. So there, there, we think that you know thoughtful land use planning will certainly be be required when when thinking about siting utility scale wind and solar. But I think it's a very manageable issue, and we certainly don't anticipate you know a, a need to be um, placing wind and solar within. Know, the, the forested areas of the state. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Vidum, did you have any additional questions or comments? Uh, may I just uh, respectfully uh, disagree? My experience says that cattle will, or grazing animals will not go near a wind generator. Okay. Appreciate your comment. Uh, all right, it looks like our next question or comment will be from Elise Jones. Director Jones, go ahead. Uh, first, let me say, Will, welcome back to the Dr. Cog table. Always nice to, uh, in air quotes, see you here. Um, and I appreciated your presentation on the climate roadmap. It is particularly timely and poignant. As you well know, up in Boulder County, we uh, were struck by two wildfires over the um, weekend, um, including one that in a mere five hours exploded into our largest acreage fire in county history due to the, the extreme dryness um, from a warming climate that's exacerbating that, that ongoing drought condition. So I appreciate this. Um, and in, in, I would like to hear your advice to Dr. Cog in particular about how we might support um, the roadmap elements related to transportation. Um, and in particular, I'd love your thoughts on, we're in the process of, of um, updating, uh, moving towards adoption of the 2050 MetroVision RTP next summer. And the timing is a little off with what the roadmap is suggesting for adopting greenhouse gas transportation budgets will likely have be adopting the 2050 MVRTP um, before that actually goes into place. So wondering any advice or guidance you have in terms of how Dr. Cog can be a partner in supporting this efforts and not, not miss the wave, if you will. So a, a couple of thoughts on that. You know, first, I, I would say that given you know, the, the deep experience that Dr. Cog has in sort of engaging on in scenario planning and transportation, the fact that you have had Metro Vision goals on you know, vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases for about a, a decade now, I, th I think that the, the state can learn a lot from Dr. Cog's work and experience. So one, you know, one request I think would be for you know, Dr. Cog, perhaps through the staff to, to 
really engage in helping to develop uh, the state programs and providing you know, input into that that process. Um, a second thing that I that I would say is that I don't think you necessarily have to wait for the the state to adopt a, you know an, a new uh, approach on greenhouse gas emission targets for transportation plans. I I would suggest sort of active engagement um, with CDOT in the air division on you know what types of, of budgets are possible and to have Dr. Cobb you know consider voluntarily a, adopting a HG budget for the 2050 plan that that aligns with where we would likely be be headed statewide. Um, so that that would be would be one thing. But another would be to really build on the work that you've done over the years on you know, scenario planning and scenario analysis that I think has has typically shown you know that uh, that approaches that you know focus largely on compact development, constraining the growth of uh, the regional urban growth boundary or urban growth area, and really uh, focusing transportation investment in multimodal ways can have you know really uh, typically performs best uh, on virtually every metric, and I would encourage the board to to think very hard about that in the context of the 2050 plan. And then I would really note uh, the importance of electrification, and this is something that you know I think historically has not been as large of a a focus for um, the MPOs, but to be really thinking through and you know every infrastructure project that you're that you're funding, um, how you're allocating CMAC dollars and SDP metro dollars to really think through um, the the role that Dr. Cog planning and investment could play in supporting that transition to zero emission vehicles, again, both for individual cars, but also for fleets and public transit. So those would be at least a, a few thoughts there. Thanks, that's super helpful. All right, thank you, Director Jones. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Director Mulvey. Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, there, I really appreciated this because we're doing some land development in Castle Pines now, and we have some decisions to make going forward. One question I have is a little bit unrelated to that. It's more of a policy question, and um, it's just a learning issue for me. In relation to the agriculture sector, sector, one of the things that you have in your slide on that mentions expanding the advancing renewable energy, improving soil function, et cetera, and increasing participation in fields, market, soil health partnership, and precision agriculture programs. And sometimes that tends to sound like sort of reallocating, you know, what people plant and where people plant and what farmers do and plant and things like that. And I'm wondering if that's what you envision or if it's something different. So so this is one that I can give a very superficial answer on. I, I would have to say it's pretty much outside of my sort of arena of expertise and I'm happy to put you in touch with Kate Greenberg, the Commissioner of Agriculture, if you're interested in a Delving in in more depth, you know that okay. the Acre Three uh, program is an existing program that's relatively small scale that we would like to to grow. That basically provides technical assistance and um, access to grant funding and financing to help farmers who want to do renewable energy projects and uh, to do. Um, energy efficiency improvements in their operations. The the soil health program, I, I think, is, is all about sort of volunt voluntary program to incentivize um, carbon capture in soils. And you know, in the long term, maybe you have some sort of carbon markets that support that by essentially pro providing um, revenue to, to 
farmers to to compensate them for sequestration of carbon in the soils. In the in the nearer term, I think I think we would be looking at creating um, smaller scale pilots to to provide those sorts of incentives. Um, but with that said, I I would, as I said, be happy to put you in touch with Commissioner Greenberg. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Director Mulvey. Uh, we do have uh, an additional uh, question or comment from Christopher Larson. So, Director Larson, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is Christopher Larson, Mayor of Netherland. Will, it's great to see you, at least okay. virtually. <laughs> um, I, I guess my question is kind of with regards to a lot of these programs um, or projects that are suggested in terms of electrification of fleets, push to electrify the transportation industry, increase public transportation uh, or zero net carbon transportation, uh, rail systems are not inexpensive. Obviously, they're expensive choices. I know that Netherland here, we've been looking at trying to figure out how to electrify our fleet, which is yeah, especially difficult being at such a high altitude and needing snow plows. Um, and so I'm curious, what is the feeling in terms of, is it time to um, reassess the long overdue increase in gas tax, gas tax to help fund some of these projects? Is there much appetite for that from the governor's office in terms of actually finally paying for this via the, the carbon debt we're incurring by driving? Yeah, so great question. And I probably can't speak to the specific sort of mix of, of revenue sources, but certainly we are recommending that we need a new revenue source that we think should be connected to, you know, have a nexus with transportation um, to um, support investment in both infrastructure and fleet replacement going forward. And you know, I I probably can't get out over my skis uh, too much on exactly what that revenue mix would look like. Um, I, I would note that another sort of related related issue that is spoken to briefly in the in the roadmap is, is that we we are recommending a future work stream to evaluate the potential for starting to shift um, some of the taxation in the state from income tax to uh, carbon pollution. It's super complicated to figure out how you do that in a way that's a, at least as progressive as the existing income tax structures in a way that uh, maintains a stable revenue source for for the state and you know under understanding both the additional emissions reduction and sort of the macroeconomic impacts of that type of a cost of a tax shift but there's real interest in the administration in this and we do recommend a, a future work stream you know probably starting um, after after the end of this calendar year to really start exploring that kind of an opportunity Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that answer, and uh, I pre also appreciate the use of the skiing metaphor as we start to look forward to snow this weekend and uh, snowmaking operations beginning at Eldora. So thanks, Will. We're all looking forward to snow. <laughs> thank you, Director Larson. Okay, it looks like uh, we have an additional question or comment from Director Sandgren. Director Sandgren, go ahead. Thank you. I couldn't figure out if I was raising my hand or lowering my hand, so sorry. <laughs> So I just yeah. want to say thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's very interesting. I like that there's going to be incentives rather than um, penalties. That's always helpful, um, especially in this time where we don't know where our budgets are going to be um, in the next five years or so. Um, I think it's important too, you mentioned traffic is the number one um, polluter right now. And I, I don't see that changing given the way our traffic and um, transit opportunities are, especially um outside of the uh most populated city so you know covid transit cuts have actually increased traffic for us up in the north i'm up, up in thornton and so what we're seeing is i think we're about a hundred percent back to where we were before covid 
Um, and so that's still with the number of people and businesses doing telecommuting from home. And so that leads us to believe it's going to be worse if we do go back. Um, and so I wonder, um, you know, RTD has cut some of our service up here and, um, you know, understandably with the lack of ridership. But what's, what we're seeing is that more people are having to drive because those, um, those routes that are no longer available were their only route options to get to work, to get to the doctor, to get to the grocery store. So I think moving forward with this is just gonna be really important um, that we look at all of our, our transit agencies and then looking at a regional approach, especially we know what our, what our own needs are. And so when we talk about funding sources, I hope that um, the oversight committee for RTD and any other transit agency really considers allowing the regions to put that money to use where we know it needs to go rather than having one um, statewide entity tell us where it needs to go. And so um, I, I think this is really interesting and um, look forward to seeing, I guess, what comes out of it in the next few years. Thanks, and I, I certainly, I sort of very much agree in terms of the challenges facing public transit right now during the, the COVID era. Well, and another, and one more thing to add to that is, you know, elderly and disabled is another um, subset that, you know, I don't know how, how do they fit into this, I guess. I didn't really hear into the details to that level, but they are going to be a population that grows tremendously and their need for transit is going to explode uh, probably more so than any other group. So um, I'd be interested to see what that looks like as well, just knowing that the, the need for transit in that population especially um, is a little bit different than what the rest of us might, might be able to do. Yep, yeah, no, I think that will certainly be very important to to look at and any uh, transit plans going going forward. All right, thank you, Director Sandgren. And with that, uh, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to our chair. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, Executive Director Tor, thank you so much for your, your detailed um, um, presentation and your, your, your time to address our comments and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, if anybody has uh, additional questions, I'm easy to find, will.tour at state.co.us. And again, we would uh, encourage either Dr. Cog or individual jurisdictions that uh, want to make formal comments to get those in by November 1st, if you can, otherwise by November 12th. Thank you so much. Um, and, and with the conclusion of that item, I will move on to item five. Um, report of the chair, I have nothing to report at this time. Uh, under that, report on performance and engagement committee. Uh, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Kevin Flynn. I am the chair of the performance and engagement committee last uh, two weeks ago. We, uh, let me look, grab that other screen. Uh, we had a uh, uh, an executive session actually as part of our meeting, but, but the first order of business was to select a representative to the nominating committee and the performance and engagement uh, committee um, elected uh, Director Aaron Brockett to be our representative on the nominating committee. We then moved into an executive session during which we reviewed uh, Executive Director Rex's performance evaluation. Uh, Jerry Stigel uh, attended with us and went through the results that were uh, drawn from a survey of our uh, board of directors, those who participated, uh, outside agencies with whom we partner, and um, uh, internal staff reports to direct, uh, Executive Director Rex. Uh, it was a it was a very good evaluation. In fact, uh, we did uh, renew his contract, uh, and uh, actually, we didn't have to take action on that. It, it's simply that we affirmed it. And uh, also, want to let the directors know that uh, uh, at the direction of uh, uh, Director Rex, uh, there is no s increase in salary because of the. Uh, COVID economy and, and just the status of, of where things are right now. Uh, Director Rex insisted that he uh, would not accept a, uh, an increase in salary, even if one were offered. And so we appreciate that very much, but we also appreciate the stellar job that he has done for us. And that's my report, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Flynn, my apologies for not introducing you before I, I turned it over to you. 
oh, that's all right. I know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Most days. <laughs> <laughs> you sure do. Uh, um, next item report on the Finance and Budget Committee. Director Conklin, please. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, uh, just like uh, performance and engagement, we named a representative to the nominating committee, that is Jim Dale. We thank Jim for his uh, willingness to serve in that role. We uh, voted on a resolution recommending board approval of the 2021 budget, which this group will see in a upcoming meeting. It's a 12 month budget, although we will have a new budget in six months as we work to adjust our fiscal year. So, which we've, we've talked about previously. We had six resolutions that we dealt with authorizing the executive director to uh, negotiate contracts or execute contracts. And I will defer to executive director Rex if he wants to call out any of those specifically. Otherwise, I will leave my report at that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Director Conklin. Uh, next item, report of the executive director. Executive director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll be brief this evening, try to get us a little bit back on time, but I thought that was a tremendous conversation um, with uh, Director Tor, so I appreciate his presence at, there at our meeting this evening. Um, first, I'll start uh, this evening with a reminder of Friday's Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. If you haven't yet registered, you can still do so by going to the Dr. Cog's homepage and just scrolling down just a little bit to the events section and you'll see it listed there and you just click on that and uh, it'll take you right to the registration play page. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to do that. Quite frankly, while this is geared towards small communities, um, there are uh, three topics that are gonna be discussed in that that uh, might interest um, um, anybody on the board. So you're more than welcome to participate, of course. Um, I also wanted to call to your attention a learning opportunity with an important partner of Dr. Cog's. Uh, um, that will be hosted next week on Wednesday, October 28th. The State Demography Office is hosting their 38th annual State Demography Summit. Um, it'll be held virtually, of course, and it's free of charge. Um, it might not sound like the most exciting event in the world, but our great friend, uh, Elizabeth Gard Gardner, who's the State Demographer and her team, they always do a fantastic job of sharing information. As many of you know, have heard presentations from her in, in the past. Um, so as you can imagine, this year's summit is focusing on the 2020 census, um, data and tools their office have developed uh, to understand the pandemic on Colorado's county. So if you're, you're able to uh, participate in that, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, you can find out some more information by, um, by visiting demography.dola.colorado.gov or <coughs> Just simply shoot myself or Brad Calvert an email and we'll direct you to the right place. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, the last thing I'm gonna mention uh, this evening um, is that I wanted to recognize one of our members of our senior staff that is retiring at the end of this month. Um, many of you know him, uh, Jerry Stiegel. He's our Director of Organizational Development and he's calling it quits after uh, he's worked at Dr. Cog for about, oh, well, just over seven years now. and. Um, uh, Jerry and I came to Dr. Coggett about the same time back in 2013, and I'm, I'm truly going to miss him, and I do want to take this opportunity to thank him for everything that he's done to make us a better, better, more function, functioning agency. Uh, Jerry, as those long-timers on the board know, he spearheaded our strategic planning initiative that led to a new mission and vision st statement um, for the agency and board, and really changed the way we think about initiatives um, that we pursue. Um, quite frankly, look at initiatives to ensure we are advancing uh, this agency to fulfill board established objectives. So Jerry, on behalf of myself and staff, and I'm sure I speak for the entire board, as um, thank you for your service, sir. Uh, enjoy more hours uh, on the Colorado's beautiful uh, rivers fishing, and I hope you finally catch that big one that always seems to get away. Thank you, sir, very much. And Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Uh, thank you very much, Executive Director Rex, and uh, personally, Jerry, uh, I, I second that, and I'm sure as the rest of the board does, uh, we wish you the best in retirement and continued success. Um, next item, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items 
we'll begin immediately after the last speaker. Uh, for those who would like to uh, have public comment, please uh, raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have anybody for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I will start to see if there's anyone on the phones. If there's anyone on the phone, please hit star six now. Okay, I am not hearing anyone and I am not seeing any hands raised, so I'll hand it back to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. We'll close public comment at 7.45 p.m. Uh, the next part of our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, item eight, I will need a, a motion to approve the consent agenda. If anybody would like to uh, present a motion, please re raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first hand that went up I saw was from uh, Herb Atchison. So Director Atchison, go ahead. So moved. Thank you, Director Atchison. Is, is there a second? There is from Director Teal. So Director Teal, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can second. Second. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Stevens, could you please open the phone lines so we can uh, go for a vote? Absolutely, and we should be good. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, those against, abstain. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next part of our agenda is informational briefings. Item nine, solicitation of interest to serve on the RTC stack, B470 and ACA, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, and I'll be brief. I, I, I swear I was gonna use my video tonight, so I, I hopefully I remember for the remainder of this meeting. Um, I'll be brief. I think the, the memo is pretty self-explanatory. Um, we are seeking interest from, from board directors to serving on um, two committees that are organized by, by Dr. Cog, and those are the Regional Transportation Committee mm -hmm and the advisory committee on aging. We are also seeking interest for those who want to serve on the uh, state transportation advisory committee and the E470 board of directors. We'll be sending out reminders to you um, over the next in the next couple, three weeks. The, the deadline for, for um, um, submitting interest is uh, Friday, November 13th. Um, but like I said, we'll be sending out reminders to you, but we, uh, I, I strongly encourage you to, to consider serving on one of these groups. These are great groups. Um, they're good partners of ours, and uh, we, it's important that we have a, uh, a seat at the table. So thank you, sir, very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item, item 10, results in the 2050 small area forecast gap analysis. Mr. Calvert, please. Thank you. Let me make sure I get squared away here. I uh, can uh, Lisa or Melinda confirm that everybody can see my screen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not it in full uh if someone else sees something different let me know we're seeing like okay. a thin thin part of your screen <laughs> oh okay that's weird let's see this it looks like a split screen both sides black yeah let's keep working on it here So, Mr. Chair, should we have some music as we wait? Yeah. Oh, man. You know, I think we should do a poll to see what kind of music we should have as the bumper uh, music. Well, I thought <laughs> you should just be able to do that. Hmm. As uh, as past chair, I, I'll, I'll yield to you, Director Pfeiffer. <laughs> Crazy dream popped in my head. Brad, do you want me to just show it on my screen? Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Let's do that. There you go. We all squared away? Yep. All right. Well, thank you for everybody's patience on that. Uh, you never know quite how this is going to work out. Um, uh, so, hi, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad Calvert, I'm the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, at, 
at Dr. Cog, and thank you, Lisa, for, for helping me sort of work through this. Um, as noted in the memo, uh, in the title of this slide, uh, really this item is attempting to compare uh, Dr. Cog's recently completed uh, 2050 small area forecast uh, to regional aspirations and areas of continuous improvement, uh, also known as outcomes and objectives, uh, identified in uh, the Metro Vision Plan. So next slide. Um, just sort of a quick orientation uh, to a few recent and current activities uh, that are di directly re related to this item. Uh, last month, my colleague Andy Taylor shared uh, the actual 2050 household and employment forecast uh, with the board, uh, and those will be key assumptions included in the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan that's been alluded to a few times uh, this evening. Andy is on the line again, uh, just in case there are any questions that come up uh, that he could uh, be, would be better positioned uh, to answer. Um, when we do this sort of analysis, there's sort of a number of dimensions that come into play when performing analysis on growth trends. Uh, the slide suggests kind of a, a bright line between what you will be seeing tonight in October or uh, later in November. Um, in general terms, uh, we're going to focus on uh, how we are growing as a region uh, and then in a, in a subsequent uh, presentation uh, where we are growing. I would say that the, the line between those two is not necessarily bright all the time. So you may see some things tonight that feel like a where are we growing, but we did our best to try to sort of uh, uh, separate the content uh, a little bit. Um, and then one very quick important note that you see on the slide, um, uh, as noted in September, uh, our fore this forecasting product, the small area forecast, is an integral part of our tra travel demand modeling efforts uh, that are part of the of the regional transportation plan. And so Dr. Cox staff is gearing up to complete uh, that analysis. So you really won't see much analysis in the way of transportation implications. Uh, related to uh, growth patterns in tonight's presentations, but you will probably see uh, information related to that uh, in the coming months. So next slide. So we shared a version of this slide uh, last month, but really tonight's uh, focus is in that sort of orange box. Um, to what extent did the small area uh, forecast, um, our current sort of air quotes here, as planned growth assumptions uh, suggest a gap, uh, the term we've been using between uh, how the region collectively anticip anticipates where growth will occur uh, versus the opportunity to achieve uh, shared outcomes as outlined uh, in the Metro Vision Plan. So next slide. A uh, quick couple quick reminders. Uh, so Metro Vision, uh, as you can see, sort of the cover of the plan on the slide, uh, unanimously adopted by the board uh, in January of 2017. Uh, there have been a few rounds of, of pretty minor updates that have come through the board uh, as well. Ultimately, MetroVision uh, is about collective impact, uh, with the varied contributions of local governments, uh, in particular, being central to the region achieving uh, those shared uh, outcomes. Uh, through MetroVision, the board also established a series of measures and targets uh, to design, design to verify uh, if our collective actions are moving the region towards these outcomes. Um, Dr. Cox staff reports annually uh, on those performance measures. You actually saw a report on that from Andy uh, back in May. Um, annual uh, performance measure reporting brings forward sort of data observations. Uh, what's unique about the opportunity that we're bringing forward this evening is to sort of talk about a view of the future um, as defined uh, both by those as planned uh, growth assumptions out to the year uh, 2050. So next slide. Uh, I've used a lot of these terms that you see on this slide uh, already and I, I did not mean it to be a shout out to Jerry Stiegel, but you could certainly think of it. Uh, as, as that, it's a snapshot of Dr. Cog's overall strategic planning model and how it intersects uh, with the MetroVision plan. Um, based on what you see on the slide, uh, the MetroVision document itself sort of picks up uh, in the middle of uh, that triangle. Those overarching themes and outcomes are sort of the altitude uh, where MetroVision starts and it carries all the way forward through uh, the identification of strategic initiatives that you see uh, hopefully on the bottom of the slide. Um, the framing of tonight's presentation is really at that objective level. You can't miss the stars on the slide. Uh, objectives are closely aligned with outcomes and are designed to allow, allow us to understand if we're actually moving uh, in the right direction or we're moving towards uh, those associated outcomes. So you, you will see a lot of the framing uh, and the data that comes forward uh, as uh, oriented towards objectives. So next slide. Uh, these were actually presented last month, but a, a few quick recaps uh, before we dive in. Uh, it's important to note uh, that growth is uh, slowing in our region uh, over the next 30 years, uh, particularly compared to the previous 30 years. 
um, you're seeing some some time periods uh, on the slide in front of you. Uh, that's in terms of raw numbers. Uh, household employment growth is shown on the slide, uh, but particularly mo noticeable if you were to convert these into percentages uh, based on uh, population and employment in the region now, uh, a, a substantial slowing uh, of growth. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, next slide. Um, as noted in the memo, and again uh, last month as well, our forecasting work uh, really starts uh, where the State Demography Office ends. Uh, central to their forecasting work is the notion that the metro area in the state of Colorado, uh, our growth rates are tied to, to growth uh, within the nation. All of those are expected to decline over the next uh, 30 years, though Colorado is expected to continue to outpace uh, the nation. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm about to hit you all with sort of an avalanche of, of data slides, uh, which I know is great for some people. People are probably uh, rolling eyes for and, and other quarters. Uh, but I'll pause about halfway through just to see if there are any questions about the first set of slides and then continue uh, with the remainder of the presentation. Um, I'll do my best to just sort of hit highlights um, for each slide. Uh, if you peeked ahead to the final slide in the packet, uh, you'll see that one of the things that we're asking this evening and we'll ask in subsequent presentations are uh, if there's any items of interest that, that the board would want to do a deeper dive um, on. That could be either the specific data analysis that you're, that's being shown to you this evening or the objective from the MetroVision plan, maybe a, an analysis that we've not done uh, that might uh, come to mind for you. Uh, all the slides are basically using the objective as kind of the header uh, for each of the, each of the slides. If you do bring forward um, some ideas of a deeper dive, just know tonight we may be mostly writing down sort of the things that are on your mind more so than, than offering a definitive, a definitive answer, but we can certainly come back uh, with additional information as well. And as always, uh, questions for clarity are, are always welcome. So uh, what you're seeing on this initial uh, data slide uh, is something called population weighted density. Uh, that is actually a performance measure uh, in the MetroVision plan established by, by the board. Um, so when we present this measure uh, during our annual performance measurement reporting, uh, you're really seeing observations. So that's why you see in the green line, we actually show uh, a few observations up to, to not too far from, from 2020. Uh, but again, this is sort of an opportunity to sort of look forward, forecast forward uh, to see how we're doing um, on this measure based on uh, our uh, now current forecast. Um, so, so you can see that, that based on the small area forecast that we presented last month, the region should anticipate hitting uh, the MetroVision target on population weight and density sometime between the year 2030 and 2040. You can see the target on the slide next to the table. Um, you'll note that that forecast line, the sort of orange line that you see, um, pretty much stays uh, above sort of that blue aspiration line uh, throughout uh, most of the forecast period. Uh, you may also note that there is a slight slowing um, or leveling off uh, of that uh, population weighted density uh, from the forecast years between 2040 and 2050. Uh, next slide, Liz. Uh, MetroVision also seeks uh, diverse housing options uh, that meet the needs of residents of all ages, incomes, and abilities. Uh, we don't actually forecast housing unit production. Uh, we're forecasting households. Uh, the easy way to think about that is uh, Households don't travel or rarely travel, uh, but the people uh, in those households do travel. Um, and so that household growth and location are primary for us to understand in our, in our transportation uh, planning work. Uh, so with that, there are some limitations in terms of looking out uh, uh, to the future uh, related to specific housing units, unit counts or types. But um, in this case, we're really looking at some data that we create uh, to assist uh, with our forecasting and performance uh, measure work uh, to see the last decade um, as you can see on the slide, represented a pretty dramatic shift in the types of housing uh, produced um, in the region. Uh, looking at the housing portfolio in our region in 2010, approximately three quarters of the housing units in the region were single family uh, versus a quarter uh, multifamily. Uh, over the last decade, uh, we've seen pretty close to a 50-50 split uh, between housing production uh, related to either single family or, or multifamily. And even with that very um, dramatic change over the last decade, relatively modest change in that 2020 portfolio, uh, dropping just a few percentage points uh, on the single family side and raising obviously a few percentage points uh, on, on the multifamily side. Next slide, please. Uh, and I just mentioned, you know, we obviously aren't uh, uh, 
forecasting sort of number of, of housing used to, to be built in the region uh, to accommodate our anticipated growth, but we do have a sense of the types of people and households that will live in those units. And that's really what you're, what you're seeing on, on, on the slide. Uh, this table was actually produced um, originally in May of 29 uh, as part of that data brief that you're seeing on, on the left-hand side of the slide, but it has been updated to incorporate the most recent uh, forecast uh, information. Uh, for those out there of you that are out there that are quickly looking at the sort of total column on the right-hand side, because uh, that really is sort of the, the primary story here, uh, you'll see that um, our forecast assumes that about a half the anticipated household growth uh, um, over the next 30 years will be households uh, with more with more than one adult but no children present and children really means people under 18 uh, and the household type that grows the second fastest are single person households uh, without children um, so when when metro vision uh, the board's established plan for the future uh, aspires to have diverse housing options that meet the needs of residents of all ages incomes and abilities uh, this is obviously an important uh, dimension to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So in the next few slides, I'll transition um, to a few sort of housing affordability and attainability uh, data points, uh, and then we'll pause to see if there are any questions. Um, the slide in front of you brings forward some economic research from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's indexing home prices in the metro area to the year 2000. Uh, that's sort of on over there on the Y axis, you can see that. Uh, by three sort of tiers of housing, um, sort of the, the lower lowest tiered price homes, uh, sort of middle tier um, and highest tier. Uh, pretty quick, quickly to observe uh, from, from this particular graphic that really it's been, um, those bands have largely hung together um, between 2000 and 2014, uh, but very much a, di a different story uh, after 2014 with, with quite a bit of separation uh, between those uh, with obviously the lowest tiers you can see on the slide. Uh, seeing the largest increase uh, in cost relative to 2000, uh, the benchmark uh, for this analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So now we'll focus um, on not just the sort of the, uh, the home uh, or the housing unit itself uh, and the, the affordability of it, but the, the affordability relative to the people that are living uh, in those homes over the next few slides. Uh, a very quick uh, sort of statistics refresh. Uh, median basically means the middle of a sorted set of numbers. Uh, so by definition, half uh, are gonna be uh, below that number and half are gonna be above. Uh, so in the next two slides, we'll look at two periods in the past to understand housing affordability uh, for households that sit below. Um, you can also observe uh, those that sit above uh, the area's uh, median income. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2010, uh, nearly six in 10 households with incomes below uh, the area median uh, income uh, were considered cost burden. So again, uh, median means sort of that middle point of all observations, uh, meaning if they were cost burden, that that means that they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing cost, uh, And many of those were actually severely cost burdened uh, as well. Uh, so next slide. So fast forwarding to uh, 2017, uh, that percentage of cost burden households uh, remained roughly the same. Uh, perhaps particularly given the slide that you saw a, a second ago um, with those indexed home prices, maybe you expected a, a larger jump. The reality is there's sort of a, a, a data issue here in the sense that those 2010 numbers and 2017 numbers are actually five-year averages. So you're really looking at like 20, 2006 to 2010, and 2013 to 2017, so there's a fair amount of lag um, in, in, in the data. Um, but again, sort of looking back uh, as a reminder, when we talk about household growth in the region, you know, roughly 500,000 uh, households uh, over the next 25 or 30 years, uh, many of those households will earn less than the area me median, uh, even as that uh, median income adjusts over time. And these recent trends that you saw over the last few slides uh, suggest that those households with household incomes below the median are more likely to be cost burdened uh, than they are to find attainable housing uh, for their household. So with that, I know that was a lot, so maybe I'll just pause just a second to see if anybody has questions on um, items that have been presented so far. All right, thank you, Mr. Calvert. Uh, board members, if you have any questions, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, do we have any questions at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will take a quick look. Okay, it looks like we do have a question or comment from Director Sandgren. Go ahead. 
Thank you. I was just wondering, um, you said that there's a little bit of a lag, Brad, what is the next, um, when will the next data be released, I guess? So we, you know, we get the data annually and the, the lag is really kind of referring to the fact that it's a five-year average, right? So, um, you know, I'm presenting that 2017 data, but again, it's five years of a rolling average. Uh, so really it takes a while because you're using those five-year averages for, for something that's sort of in the moment uh, to be reflected in the data uh, as presented. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Director Sandgren. And with that, I don't see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to Brad. Uh, sounds good. So I'll keep rolling. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so unfortunately, you know, we can't definitively answer sort of a question that would be along the lines of, will the region produce uh, an adequate amount of affordable housing over the next 30 years? Um, for these new and changing households that I've noted a few times, but I'll, but we will offer one sort of quick insight that we can uh, bring forward. Um, over the past year or so, uh, my team has really dedicated a lot of resources uh, to collect information on anticipated development in the region, uh, to know more about the developments that are and when they are anticipated to be delivered to market. I uh, guess really helps in our in our modeling and predictive uh, work um, in terms of understanding where when housing and commercial developments are going to come uh, on, on the market. Uh, so what we refer to as our scheduled development data set includes uh, roughly 1,500 development projects across the region. Of that 1,500 or so, there's about 360 that we're, we're able to identify whether there's the presence, particularly of affordable deed restricted uh, uh, units. Um, and of those 360, there's about 73,000 units associated um, uh, with those. And of those, only approximately 5,000 were recorded as sort of deed restricted uh, units. So you, you can see that, it, that it's a pretty small subset of uh, the units that are being delivered uh, to market in the region. Uh, so next slide. Um, so MetroVision uh, notes the importance of connected urban centers and multimodal corridors uh, throughout the region uh, and those places accommodating a growing share of the region's household and employment. I'm going to cover uh, sort of some related topics uh, under that umbrella in the next couple of slides. Um, MetroVision includes a performance measure and target related to the share of the region's housing and employment near rapid transit stations or high frequency transit stops. And that's really what you're seeing uh, on the screen with, again, that sort of future oriented uh, uh, lens applied to that measure. Uh, one important caveat for this slide in particular um, is that we're holding the transit network as we understand it sort of constant uh, and we're relying on a transit network layer that we build each time we do our performance measurement work, uh, which is now several several months old. Uh, so one notable admission is from this slide is the end line. Uh, pretty easy to identify that that's not included in that sort of blue set of, of stations that are that are shown um, on the slide. So bottom line though, um, our analysis found that the region will have a similar uh, share of households uh, and employment uh, with actually a slight decline in employment uh, between 2020 and 2050 uh, for these high capacity and high frequency uh, locations. Um, obviously, an important note, uh, this does not account for the changes to the transit network uh, that could be realized over the next three decades. Uh, so you can imagine any analysis to quantify those share of households and employment near transit would show an increasing share as new high frequency and high capacity stops and stations are added uh, and the households and jobs that are nearby are included in that, in that, that calculation. So next slide, please. So pretty similar analysis here, but a, but a, but a slightly different uh, geography. Um, this uses a geography that's um, called short trip opportunity zones. Uh, uh, those areas were identified and included in the active transportation plan that the board adopted in January of, of last year. Uh, you can think of these areas as um, having high concentrations of trips that are two miles or less, uh, which really show this, uh, the potential to uh, support bicycle pedestrian trips. Um, so in many ways, this analysis is making a leap that these areas have existing multimodal uh, facilities uh, and they can see and may see continued investment uh, in those networks in the future. Uh, so as you can see on, on the slide, similar results to the, to the previous sort of high capacity, high frequency transit. Um, our analysis is suggesting an overall increase in households and jobs um, in these locations, uh, but a slight decline in the share of totals in these areas. And then the same uh, caveat applies to this slide as well as these actual 
the geography of these opportunity zones uh, increase, uh, you would hopefully see a corresponding increase in the share of jobs and, and households located in these areas uh, in the future as well. Next slide, please. So these next two slides are going to focus on the issue of access to opportunity, uh, an important addition to the MetroVision plan during the last major uh, update. Uh, MetroVision establishes that our region's economy prospers when uh, all residents have access to both basic needs as well as quality of life amenities and that there remain uh, disparities that must be addressed uh, for this outcome to be realized. Uh, for this slide and the next slide, um, we're going to use um, uh, data and tools from partner organizations to assist uh, with the analysis. Uh, in this slide, we're using uh, what are called racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty um, as calculated by HUD. Uh, and so you can see the, the HUD definition and, and how they calculate these areas on the right-hand side of, of the slide. Um, so we're just sort of focusing on the table. Um, you can see that our small area forecast accounts for a fair amount of household and employment growth um, in these locations. Uh, resulting in a higher share of regional totals in 2050 for uh, these particular um, areas. I will very quickly point out uh, it's an open question as to whether um, growth in this area actually results in additional economic and social mobility for current and future residents or if it's perhaps a signal uh, for potential gentrification and displacement uh, in these areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we are very close to the end, I promise. Um, Enterprise Community Partners is a, is, a, is a partner we work with quite a bit, it's a national organization that also has uh, an office uh, here in our region. Um, they've looked at um, access to opportunity across the entire country and have developed a tool uh, to help communities better understand the resources needed to make uh, their communities more inclusive, equitable, and connected to opportunity. Uh, so in this slide, uh, we use state level data uh, to identify a low and high opportunity zones in our region. Uh, sort of, you can see that the note uh, below the table, basically if a census tract performed really well on each of those uh, opportunity outcomes that are shown in the graphic on the right, it was considered a high opportunity zone. Uh, conversely, areas that tended to underperform uh, on these opportunity measures were classified as low opportunity zones. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the high opportunity zones uh, are a bigger draw uh, in the 2050 forecast, showing a larger share of anticipated growth uh, between 2020 and 2050. Uh, but I also mentioned that there is sort of a, a size discrepancy between these areas. The high opportunity zones are approximately seven, seven times larger in terms of total size uh, than uh, those lower opportunity uh, zones. Um, it's not shown in this particular uh, table, but uh, just another calculation that we ran, uh, we actually show that the share of households in those high opportunity zones uh, actually declines from about 15.5% to 14% uh, over the course of the forecast period over the next um, 30 years. So next slide. So just a big uh, thank you for your time and attention. I know that's a lot of information. Um, it's not really my expectation in, in this moment that you're able to process everything you heard. I, I really hope we have another chance to have another uh, conversation in the next couple of months to maybe share a little bit more uh, of this analysis. So, for instance, uh, this presentation did not include any information about expected growth in urban centers or employment centers. Those are both areas of emphasis um, in the MetroVision plan. Um, as noted in the memo, this, this analysis uh, project really aims to share more detail about the region's anticipated growth trajectory. Uh, we'd like to hear from you now and in the future, sort of whether the implications of these anticipated growth patterns suggest we're headed toward achieving MetroVision outcomes, or is there more work we need to do to be uh, successful? Uh, if there is sentiment among the board um, to, to focus maybe on some key uh, focus areas, we'd obviously further anticipate uh, guidance and suggestions from the board on potential activities and initiatives that staff uh, could pursue um, as well as uh, in partnership with, with your communities. Um, happy to hear any early thoughts you have this evening, uh, or obviously you can take more time to reflect and we can pick up this conversation uh, at a future uh, meeting. Um, the last little set of bullets on the slide, I'll say that as staff, I don't think we walked into this particular analysis thinking of it as an input uh, for uh, an anticipated MetroVision amendment that we sort of have had on the calendar uh, for 2021. But the more we worked on it, um, it became clear that this may be something uh, that we should be thinking about as we uh, prepare uh, for that. Um, so for instance, 
Uh, we may want to capture uh, the, any board priorities that come out of these conversations uh, in uh, that potential amendment, as well as um, one of the things that we pretty much do regularly as staff is try to understand potential adjustments to those performance measures and targets uh, that we might want to be thinking about. And so some of this analysis might inform some of staff's thinking um, on that as well. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have a discussion, uh, answer any questions uh, that you have, or uh, we can move on to the next item, whatever's the pleasure of the board. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Calvert. Uh, board members, if you have any questions for Brad, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Um, Ms. Stevens, um, I will let you navigate the questions. Thank you so much. Okay, it looks like our first question or comment is from Director Atchison. Please, go ahead. Hey, Brad, how are you getting the data that you're looking, especially in the workforce housing market, affordable housing, either for rent or for sale? So, I mean, the, you know, I, we presented sort of two things tonight kind of in that. Um, the, the census is our source for that uh, sort of cost burdened uh, status. Uh, and then our other source uh, for kind of that production side, what type of uh, units are being produced. Uh, that is really us um, sort of scanning and collecting uh, local uh, development data and doing our best to, to pull out the pieces that we can use, not only in our modeling and forecasting work, but in that case, we're to bring forward sort of our ability to identify through that sort of the lo local data sources uh, those units that have been identified as uh, deed restricted uh, affordable units. Very difficult to sort of talk about the sort of market rate side of that. It's 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 a little bit easier. I mean, easier uh, to count the the deed restricted units when we can locate them. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Director Atchison. Okay. Our next question or comment is from uh, Director Elise Jones. Director Jones. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Brad, really appreciated all of the data that you just gave to us. I, it will take me a week or two to digest it all, but um, a couple of comments. One, in terms of uh, Metro Vision alignment and sort of performance measures, target amendments, that kind of thing, it would be useful to sort of look at what we have for Metro Vision and see how it lines up with where the state is going with regards to the climate roadmap presentation that we just saw. Um, it would be nice if if we're all pulling on the oars in the same way and it, you know heading for the same targets. And I I haven't haven't taken a look at at those yet, but that might be a useful thing to do. And the second one, um, segueing off what Herb was just talking about, um, I guess looking at the affordability issue and that we haven't made as much progress as we need to in terms of um, affordable units would be my take on that. Um, because it was an issue before COVID and now it's gonna be really an issue. Um, it might be useful to do a deeper dive on uh, sort of where are we seeing those units? What are the best practices associated with um, achieving um, uh, creation of affordable units that that we you know might collectively learn from? I think could be a, a helpful uh, deeper dive. Sounds good. We'll add it to the list. All right. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, our next question or comment is from uh, Linda Olson. Director Olson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm. It's probably just following on from what Elise just said. Thank you again for this. This is great data. I'm. I'm wondering. A lot of the decisions regarding affordability and housing is just done very localized. How far down can you drill with some of this to help, um, you know, like a city of Englewood or Sheridan or even Littleton as a tri-cities to look at some of this in, in terms of forecasting? We're in the midst of some strategic planning and some homelessness oriented initiatives, and this data would be really helpful. Sure, I, I'll maybe sort of respond to that sort of in, in, in two dimensions. Um, you know, we, there, there's a fair amount of drill down that we can do on on the on the data side of this. The reality is we'll be um, largely doing what we can to sort of pick up the local data that we can observe. So it may, may not be necessarily news uh, uh, to a local community, but uh, the other side of, of this, the sort of the other dimension is um, where we're hoping to go with this is sort of this what you're seeing in those uh, sort of 
second and third bullets under that uh, second bullet here, this idea of uh, learning more about activity or initial initiative level contributions and how what priorities and focus areas uh, we might want to think about for additional efforts. Uh, and so that's really where this might come into play. So let's let's take the question that you had, uh, Director Olson, and as well as Director Jones's question. Uh, if there is a need uh, or a priority of the board uh, to think long and hard about um, the issue of supplying more affordable housing uh, or attainable housing to the region, um, then Dr. Cox staff is more than willing, uh, and in fact has sort of said in the past that we would sort of bring together uh, groups to talk about uh, those issues so that we can identify either uh, shared strategies that could be pr pursued um, uh, across the region or uh, talk about best practices that, that local governments can pursue uh, individually in ways that work for their own local context. So a lot of this is really just a check-in uh, to say, here's kind of looks like we're, where we're headed. Uh, if there is a need to really put some time and attention on a very specific topic that is a priority for, for the board uh, through the lens of MetroVision, as well as a priority based on uh, the, the information that we're sharing in those presentations, we are we are more than willing uh, to put some time and attention uh, with your team and your staff uh, to think long and hard about these issues so that we can make progress as a region and uh, as individual local communities. Excellent. Thank you. I'll probably be in touch then. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Director Olson. Uh, and with that, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Calvert. Thank you again for your presentation. We, we greatly appreciate your efforts. Um, next item, item 11, Dr. Cog, Equity Activities, Executive Director Rex, please. Here we go. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, in light of the national conversations that, that are occurring around racial equality and inclusiveness, and um, I had a conversation with the executive committee as well, we decided to provide this uh, presentation to you this evening, um, just kind of highlighting the activities that Dr. Cog has, is undertaking in this space. Um, furthermore, I know we have a number of new or newer board members who may or may not um, know much about Dr. Cog's role in this area, and hopefully this will provide some background on uh, federal requirements that we have and, and how we are complying, uh, complying with this uh, responsibility. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, um, we would welcome a conversation about what we presented this evening and as well as any ideas you may have for us to improve our process. So what we're gonna do tonight, we're gonna tag team, um, at least I'm gonna tag team with uh, some of our division directors on, on this presentation. Um, I'm gonna start and uh, just real quickly and then I'll turn it to Brad, then Jayla, then Ron. Um, we'll discuss the work within their respective divisions. So next slide, please. So real quickly is one of my responsibilities as executive director, as you can imagine, is compliance with, uh, with, with federal law um, pertaining to um, um, you know, civil rights requirements or basically anything that revolves around us being recipients of federal money. So these are some of the acts and, 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 and requirements that, that uh, we must comply with. And quite frankly, we, we're, we, uh, we actually, I sign a policy statement every year declaring the adherence to, to the required federal laws that are listed above. Next slide, slide please. And again, I work with, uh, with all of our staff, of course, but uh, primarily with our HR department to make sure that we have certain plans and programs in place that are, um, accurately reflected and on, on our website and and quite frankly not only that that we are actually implementing and engaging in conversations with with um, uh, groups throughout this region um, that we need to be doing so i would like to point out um, the title six implementation plan is something that we've really really put a lot of work in over the past few years and i would encourage you if you get an opportunity to visit that on our website also, the public engagement plan, we brought to you kind of our revised public engagement plan. Oh, it's probably a year or so ago now um, when, when, uh, when we hired Lisa Hood to, to uh, kind of spearhead that. And we're, 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 we're very proud of that document. We think we've done a tremendous job. It kind of lays out different paths that we take based on the type of work that, that, we, are, that we, are, we are pursuing. Um, and we have been following that to a T. And I know Ron's going to talk a little bit about some of the work they're doing in respect to our regional transportation plan. 
So with that, those are my two slides. I'm going to turn it to Brad, and he's got he's got a number. And um, go ahead, Brad. Thanks, Doug. Uh, my apologies that you're getting me back to back. Uh, I'll do my best to be be quick and and maybe entertaining. I don't know. Um, as you'll see on the slide, and you're going to hear from 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 Jayla, myself, and and Ron. We're all going to be just sort of sh be sharing uh, some work and activities uh, in our division. Just quick sort of uh, orientation. So I'm in the I'm the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division. We oftentimes shorten that to RPD. So if you hear me say that, that's what that means. I don't want you to get lost that I'm talking about some other new acronyms. So I'll, I'll just quickly want to mention uh, that I'm going to step through some examples or programs and projects uh, on this on this topic. Uh, but really wanted to sort of kick it off with some just key takeaways uh, from my decade or so with Dr. Cog uh, working um, on this on these issues. Um, as noted on this particular slide, uh, MetroVision is always the starting point uh, for our work. Um, as, as mentioned in the last presentation, uh, you, you know, the board unanimously adopted uh, the plan. It is an aspirational uh, vision, um, but notably it's sort of in this notion of equity. Um, during the five-year process to update the plan, the board, uh, board, the board at the time uh, were directly uh, involved in considering if and how to incorporate new elements uh, in the plan, particularly elements related to housing and economic vitality. Uh, that included the formation of two ad hoc board committees who actually took the lead on drafting uh, the plan language uh, for uh, those particular um, elements. Um, while Metrovision serves as an aspirational vision of the future that, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, relies on voluntary actions from local governments and, and a series of other stakeholders, I will say that my team uh, makes one very fundamental commitment uh, related to our role in assisting the region in achieving uh, the plan outcomes. At minimum, that plan will always inform our work program. Like That is just a given that that is our North Star when, it, when, when we think about what we are going uh, to work on as, as a team. Um, you know, obviously MetroVision recognizes the plan's outcomes require contributions from uh, numerous partners and sectors. Just my day-to-day -day job is spending a lot of time developing partnerships with the idea of how can those partners help us achieve the MetroVision plan as sort of front and center uh, to that work. Um, you know, I, I wish I could virtually sit here or stand here and suggest without reservation that equity is fully centered uh, in my team's work. Um, I can't really say that, I don't think, uh, but that doesn't mean we're not actively looking for uh, opportunities. Um, and the last bullet notes, um, we're, we're most frequently dealing with maybe capacity issues uh, related to advancing e equity-oriented projects more so than a commitment issue. Uh, the way that I typically describe uh, this is um, particularly to prospective partners is um, if, if you can come to Dr. Cog, me, my team, uh, with a tangible project that has defined roles for Dr. Cog that play to our strengths, we can typically um, give real thoughtful consideration to being able to, to, to support that project. What we oftentimes just don't have the bandwidth to do is to sort of build an idea or concept from the ground up, unless it is very much um, oriented to sort of a specific role and activity mandated for Dr. Cog. Uh, so over the next few slides, I'll sort of give a glimpse into what I sort of think of as our equity portfolio uh, there's more that I could brought could have brought forward, but I'm hoping the next few slides are instructive. So next slide, please. Obviously, as everyone knows, uh, through Dr. Cog, the Denver region has been focused on regionalism and regional planning for the last 60 years or so. Um, for about half that time, the last 30 years, um, we've been working sort of under that umbrella of, of MetroVision as the region's plan. So you, as you can imagine, over a 30-year period, um, there's this sort of constant series of critically important regional dialogues that either confirm, advance, or adjust uh, regional priorities um, as outlined in the plan. A really recent example of that uh, is something called the Sustainable Communities Initiative, uh, a three-year effort funded through HUD um, to, and supported by a partnership of, of other federal agencies as well. So over three years, uh, Dr. Cog and, and uh, many partners around the region uh, collaborated on numerous uh, efforts to maximize the benefits that accrue to the region and to individuals and families uh, through our region's investment and expanding our transit work network. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, trying to fit three years of work into one slide means I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. Uh, but I tried to include the things that are sort of most focused on equitable outcomes. So a few things that are among the bullets is um, SCI resulted in regional housing, economic 
opportunity studies that informed uh, the current Metro Vision plan. Those were, were actually, those studies were the starting point uh, for those ad hoc board committees uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and they considered their findings and how those findings could inform the Metro Vision update uh, that was underway at the time. And that is uh, the plan that was adopted unanimously in 2017. Um, through SEI, we developed an, a sort of an online tool to raise awareness uh, among a wider range of stakeholders, including the public, about the benefits and opportunities that robust uh, public transit network can, can create, uh, including access to opportunity uh, for everyone uh, in the region. Uh, SCI funds were also directed to development and market analyses for catalytic development projects at rail stations, uh, including properties owned by local housing authorities, several of which of those projects are now open and, and have uh, residents uh, living in them. Um, and the initiative also supported a creation of sort of interjurisdictional inter action plans uh, to create com complete communities around uh, transit stations with housings, housing for all types of households. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just sort of hit three here pretty quick. Um, again, the SEI work fed directly into the MetroVision update. Uh, you can see sort of one of the outcomes um, in the plan that the region is comprised of diverse uh, livable communities. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, but as I mentioned, there were sort of two overarching themes that were new to the plan. They're additions to the plan that really kind of rolled out of the of the of the SEI work, uh, including a new theme uh, related to healthy, uh, inclusive, and livable communities, uh, with a new emphasis on housing uh, that meets the needs of current and future residents as they progress through their various stages of life. I've actually always really, really liked that that phrasing. That is directly from that board ad hoc committee. They, they, they really actually came up with direct plan language uh, for that. Um, next slide, please. Another uh, new theme, again, rolling out of the SCI work is this idea of a, a vibrant regional economy, uh, sort of pointing to something I mentioned in the previous uh, deck of slides. You know, the plan very specifically note, notes that the region's economy prospers when all residents have access to opportunity while recognizing that there are obviously very real disparities uh, that do exist uh, across the region. Uh, next slide. So this is definitely a JLA's work program, but it's just a really good example of, uh, of, a, of a program or a project where there's sort of multiple points of intersection um, uh, related to MetroVision. So I thought I'd bring it forward in, in my slides. Um, the Denver Regional Accountable Health Community uh, joins clinical and community-based uh, partners to identify and address unmet health-related social needs, think housing, uh, transportation, food security. Uh, Dr. Cog functions um, as the bridge organization uh, to convene those clinical and community-based partners, uh, creating kind of a clinical and community continuum of care. Uh, through the AHC, uh, clinical partners screen clients uh, in those clinical settings to identify their health-related social needs and then navigate those individuals and families to community-based organizations to help them meet their needs and support their overall uh, well-being. So each team, each year, my team goes through a process to evaluate whether the H AHC is serving uh, neighborhoods that may benefit most uh, from those community-based services to help them uh, meet those health-related social needs. So you can see this, these are sort of bullets from the last time we did that evaluation. We had some um, uh, types of households and communities that we did pretty well. Uh, in reaching, but we definitely have some improvements in terms of uh, uh, households and, and communities we do need to reach. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one just last kind of MetroVision related one. Um, obviously, I've mentioned performance measures uh, a few times. Uh, we use those measures and targets to help uh, determine whether our collective actions to implement the plan are moving uh, towards those desired outcomes. Uh, but the plan at the board's direction very specifically commits Dr. Cog to a dynamic and flexible approach uh, to performance management, meaning that we, we are continuously looking for other data, much like I shared in the previous uh, set of slides, that help us understand and illustrate whether we're making uh, progress. Um, so, for instance, uh, that sort of dynamic sort of performance um, uh, measurement, one of our products are something called regional data briefs. Uh, I used a data brief in the previous slide. Um, and then there's also a, a data brief uh, in your packet as well. Those are, again, sort of things that we work on to bring forward issues. Um, one quick sidebar on that, the data brief in the packet this evening uh, actually did, does have an error. We had a sort of a quick catch of a copy-paste error. So Doug and Melinda will get you a new copy of that uh, in the next few days so you have a correct version of that. Uh, other data briefs that we've uh, produced in the last six or nine months uh, included 
sort of something that, that attempted to understand the impact of COVID-19 on workers and at-risk industries? What's the magnitude of disruption in the economy and how is it going to affect different industries and workers in those industries? Uh, we've also put together information related to the growing gap between income uh, and housing costs uh, in the region. Next slide, please. We also lean really strongly into our role as regional convener um, through our MetroVision Idea Exchange series. Uh, these these uh, exchanges bring together local governments and other partners to learn from each other, uh, whether those are uh, common experiences or emerging uh, trends in the region, how they can ultimately share best practices and learn uh, from each other on these important topics. Uh, sessions that uh, emphasize equity are an important and popular component of these offerings, whether that's focusing on gentrification and displacement, uh, including sharing new research that's actually was grown in our region to help predict uh, when and where gentrification and displacement will occur, and tools uh, that have demonstrated track records in successfully addressing and mitigating the effects of neighborhood change. Um, or um, how local governments and other stakeholders can best respond to the growing number of doubled up households uh, that are living in single housing units um, out of economic necessity. Next slide. Uh, a program near and dear to Lisa and myself, Lisa is sort of running the back end of this, uh, Dr. Cog Citizens Academy. Um, in 2018, as you all know, Dr. Cog assumed management of the nationally recognized uh, Citizens Academy, where emerging leaders uh, learn from local experts, uh, network, network with each other, uh, and act on what they've learned uh, in that process. Um, over the past decade, uh, Citizens Academy has inspired uh, numerous alumni to serve as elected officials. Hundreds have found their way into positions in public agent, agencies and nonprofit organizations. Uh, additionally, in our time since 2018 of managing the Academy, we've seen a growing number of elected officials sign up for the academy, including uh, several Dr. Cog board members and, and alternates. And the connection here to the sort of equity space is that our curriculum uh, continues to evolve and really emphasize equity-oriented topics, uh, largely due to the reality that as our participants apply uh, for the academy, they are noting very specific interest in sort of equity-related issues. And they're also creating uh, equity-oriented uh, individual action plans uh, to guide their post-academy uh, activity. So it's, it's very much uh, what people that join the academy uh, want to, to learn and talk about. Next slide. This, this is the last one uh, for me. Um, so sometimes learning from your failures is more important than celebrating your successes. So I wanted to bring something that was actually not the most successful project, but I think it's actually really instructive and offers a good example of really how I feel like my team could potentially uh, drive equitable outcomes uh, in the region. Uh, a few years ago, in partnership with Mile High Connects, uh, Dr. Cog developed a web application designed to, to really connect mission-driven developers, so think affordable housing developers or those looking to build uh, commercial serving or community serving commercial space uh, with investors in the, in the Denver region or, or throughout the nation, actually, uh, really so that more projects that benefit communities throughout the region could access capital and build more routinely and be delivered more quickly than it's been the case uh, historically. So the, the theory of change here was that these community benefiting developments or developers throughout the region uh, often uh, struggle to complete their funding and financing and are looking for uh, ways to fill those, those funding gaps uh, or otherwise the projects just simply never, never break ground. Uh, so this project, the development project pipeline uh, would have allowed uh, developers to market their projects to potential investors, uh, particularly uh, angel investors and philanthropic organizations who have not historically been invested uh, uh, in, in real estate, but they, but an increasing recognition of how important sort of those place-based initiatives were and how, how important real estate was to that, that, that portfolio. The idea is that it would uh, provide a link to the developer uh, so that they could close uh, those often uh, observed funding gaps. Additionally, the site would have allowed uh, stakeholders, including elected officials and, and the planning community, to have a window into where the active development pipeline is uh, for these types of developments uh, to assist with sort of wider scale uh, community uh, planning efforts, programs, um, and, and, and support. So unfortunately, uh, like a lot of good ideas, this project stalled during legal review. Uh, we'd love to get into that. Uh, maybe not really, but it's, it's an interesting story to 
here, uh, something get flagged because of a law that's been on the books since 1929, but that's the case that we were in. Um, but in my mind, it's just, it's a really tremendous example of how Dr. Cog's teams, uh, when matched to the right role with the right partner, can design and develop programs and tools aimed at addressing some of our, our region's most vexing and, and intractable challenges. In this case, delivering community beneficial uh, real estate projects to meet the needs of, of communities throughout the region. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jayla, who looks like she might be multitasking. So. No. Oh, I, oh, no. I, I, okay. I, yeah, I had to. I, hi, everyone. I have to talk on the phone because I have no sound through my computer. Uh, so the the uh, equity is kind of baked into the Older Americans Act. Um, we are required to serve diverse populations, underserved populations, and hard to serve populations. It's really fundamental. Um, we the the Older Americans Act says we uh, have to serve those in greatest economic need, those in greatest social need, low income minority folks, folks that are 75 and older, and adult older adults living uh, in in rural areas. Next slide, please. Uh, all of our uh, service providers, when we contract with them, we we tell them that they must serve these hard to reach populations, um, the, the diverse populations and underserved populations. They have to give us um, a targeted plan, uh, a plan for outreach, as well as tell us how many they serve. So they have to report that to us uh, on a monthly basis, how many they served of these targeted populations. So every single provider has to do that. In our nutrition program, we actually um, uh, print our menus in five different languages um, because we serve such a diverse population through our nutrition uh, congregate meal sites. So, um, but we but we specifically fund programs uh, that serve uh, uh, diverse populations. The Southwest Improvement Council uh, supports older uh, Native Americans and uh, low-income uh, uh, Hispanic. Um, African American Support Group, Asian Pacific Center serves a lot of folks. Um, you can read these, Catholic Charities Kinship Program. This is grandparents um, uh, raising grandchildren, and it, uh, a lot of uh, folks uh, in this program fall into that underserved and uh, low-income uh, and minority category. We have an elder refugee program at Dr. Cog. You know, we're one of the few area agencies on, on aging in, in the country that partner with um, the color or the refugee center programs uh, to serve this population. We also have specific programs internally in, uh, at Dr. Cog uh, targeted to serve uh, Latino um, uh, elders, through INA, so we have Spanish speaker, uh, a Spanish speaking INA line, option counseling, case management, and benefits counseling staff that are all uh, Spanish speakers, native Spanish speakers. And then we have, um, we partner with the center that serves LGBT older adults uh, to do a lot of different programs. So my, compared to Brad's presentation, mine was very short. <laughs> Thanks, that's the end of mine. Might be muted, Ron. Can't hear you. The most common word spoken in the last eight months. You're still muted. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the transportation planning requirements. So my division, transportation planning and operations, really is the core function of the Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, which uh, Doug, Doug talked about a lot of the federal requirements that the agency has as a recipient of federal funds. But like JLA in uh, AAA, transportation planning has some very specific additional sort of requirements in these areas as an MPO. Um, so a lot of them are related to the agency-wide requirements around Title VI. We have to do specific environmental justice um, evaluations and compliance for all of our required transportation planning activities, including the Regional Transportation Plan, the Transportation Improvement Program, and our Consolidated Transit Plan. Um, the EJ analysis really focuses on the potential benefits to and impacts on particular um, uh, populations in the region. And the, and the challenge is most of that analysis is sort of 
post decision making. You've sort of made decisions. You do your environmental justice analysis as part of sort of the review of the decisions that have been made. There's less of that that sort of comes in at the front end in the decision making. Although we we have taken significant steps towards trying to incorporate that into our decision making. Um, in addition, our transportation plans and programs have to um, make sure that we provide a fully inclusive public outreach uh, program. Doug talked about the public engagement plan uh, of Dr. Cog, which is really robust. Um, and we, we, as we kicked off the development of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan that I'll talk about next, we really thought about how we could how we could shape a, a public engagement plan uh, for that major effort um, that goes beyond all these requirements. So we don't we want to make sure that we don't disproportionately impact minority and low income communities around the region, and that we have to ensure that our our plans and our decisions um, provide um, benefits to those same populations around the region. Next slide, Lisa. So as I, as I mentioned, when we started kick off the 2050 regional transportation plan process back in 2019, uh, we really uh, worked really closely with Lisa, really appreciate her work, um, and really want to commend Alvin Bedell Sanchez, one of our transportation planners, and Jacob Rieger, our transportation, long range transportation planning manager, for really picking up the mantle and thinking about how we could do more as part of um, our process of developing the 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, so we developed a really significant effort to try to go out where people were and, and attend community events throughout the region during the summer of 2019 um, and went to some really interesting uh, events ar around the entire region. And we also, um, with, with the work of Lisa, Alvin, and Jacob, uh, created two specific groups to help provide us additional input in um, our planning process to try to engage with populations that are historically underrepresented and hard to reach uh, in our planning efforts. Um, as all of you know at, at your local jurisdictions, public engagement is really hard. It's hard to get people's attention. It's hard to bring them in and, and, and get them engaged in our processes and give us input. And then there's, there's these, these other populations that are even doubly hard to reach sometimes and, and really get engaged in, in our efforts. So, uh, we created a civic advisory group uh, to provide input and guidance uh, from from representatives of those communities that are that are typically underrepresented in our planning efforts. Uh, um, they represent individuals and groups um, across the region that that really represent uh, the uh, bring us voices from those nonprofits, community-based organizations, individuals of, of those kind of historically underrepresented groups. And then, um, you know, we're doing a 30-year transportation plan, and we thought, you know, it's really important to engage with younger, um, younger people and younger adults um, throughout the region, because um, a lot of the decisions we'll make in this plan are going to affect them long term. And so we convened a youth advisory panel um, so that we could engage with those younger voices throughout the region and make sure that they're heard during the plan process. Um, we reached out to your youth boards and youth commissions. Uh, there's, um, we have 18 local youth boards and commissions from all over the region. Uh, we brought representatives from those to the table. We've been engaging with them uh, through 2019 and uh, this year to give us input during uh, kind of critical milestones of the planning process. And I really appreciated uh, their voice. They bring some unique perspectives um, into that process. So just wanted to give the board a flavor of a couple of things we're trying to do. Uh, they are admittedly baby steps, uh, but really important uh, kind of thought processes about how we can build on this in the future in our future transportation planning efforts to make sure that we're getting as many voices into our processes as we possibly can uh, to help inform your decision making as we adopt plans uh, for the region. So with that, I think I'll uh, hand it back to Doug. Great, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Jayla and Brad. Um, I really do appreciate you running through this for, for this evening, and I hope the board, if, if nothing else, you take away that we uh, we don't take these responsibilities lightly. Um, it's not about checking a box for us. I mean, we we truly believe that um, you know we're we're um, uh, you know, well. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is trying to raise voices that traditionally have not been heard in our planning process, and it's it's baby steps, as Ron said, but. Um, 
with your help, we're 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 uh, we think we're on the right track. And I I would be remiss. Just just one more thing I would like to mention. Um, we have an internal uh, group working in this space in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, they're currently this fits volunteer staff that um, are um, forming what we are calling an equity action committee and. Uh, in part, they will help us in, you know, kind of reviewing internal processes, whether they be re related to recruitment, those types of things, but also um, really helping us in uh, coming up with ideas and brainstorming about um, um, ways that we can reach out in the community and and uh, get more voices heard. So, with that, um, I thank you for your your uh, your 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 patience with this presentation and three presentations tonight. But I would love to hear any any of the board's comments and um, and even ideas that you might have that we might be able to improve our processes. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll kick it back to you. Uh, thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, board members, do we have any questions, comments, or uh, sharing of initiatives that, that your local municipality is doing, or how we can better better improve? Um, please raise your virtual hand. Press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will hand it to you to facilitate this part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. All right, so it looks like uh, our first question or comment is from Director Brockett. Director Brockett, go ahead. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great, so thank you so much for the that presentation and all that information, and I really appreciate that Dr. Cog is devoting some real efforts in this area and putting some resources into it. And particularly that outreach, like the, uh, the Civic Advisory Group and the Youth Advisory Panel, those are worthy initiatives for sure. You know, my question is, you know, a lot of Dr. Cog's work where the rubber heat hits the road kind of literally is in our uh, choosing of what transportation projects to fund. And um, how can we integrate you know, equity concerns into that in a, from the ground up, right? Like, Right, and, uh, um, Ron, you mentioned that there's often an evaluation after a decision has been made, and that's kind of rarely going to change a decision. You know, how can we look at both like benefits to underserved, low-income minority communities from different projects, and also negative consequences? You know, say when when a, a low-income neighborhood is negatively impacted by a transportation project, like can we start getting those? evaluations in at the earlier level before the decisions are made? Um, Doug, if you don't mind. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Ron, please. Certainly, I, uh, it's a really good point, Director Brockett. I think, you know, one of the things that we've started um, doing, and, and I'll, I'll tip my hat to CDOT, uh, I think Rebecca might still be, and Rebecca White still be, might be in the meeting. Um, you know, we, we took a step when in our cooperative effort in the Safer Main Streets grant program this year um, and part of the part of the criteria that we incorporated into that and some of the and the evaluation that we're that we're considering as we think about uh, what projects to fund is a bit of an equity analysis and sort of where where projects are located um, relative to vulnerable populations um, around the region so there's some geospatial analysis there to help inform that that group um, about decisions about where to allocate those resources to projects. So one consideration, um, and I think again, that's just an example of a way we can start to incorporate some of these things into into that into the funding decisions. Because uh, you're absolutely right about that. We want to get better about considering those uh, those benefits and impacts during the decision making process, not as sort of a post decision evaluation. Well, that's good to hear. And I guess I would I just I mean, propose to to our group that uh, to see how we can work more of that into our decision-making pro um, process going forward, like as we move towards the next tip cycle in a few years, for example. Okay, thank you, Director Brockett. Uh, our next question or comment is from Director Olson. Director Olson, go ahead. Thanks, and uh, I appreciate the words from Director Brockett. Uh, what I was thinking of was similar in that, how do we measure some of the impact? We do lots of environmental studies when we do projects, but we haven't looked at the human dimensions as deeply, and I'm really, really thankful to see this report tonight and appreciate all the work that went into it. 
and I guess I'm asking myself this question as well is how can we develop some metrics for this kind of human dimension of all of the things that we're doing in this area so it's more of a reflective question than anything else but thanks for your work on this Director Olson, I might just mention, I mean, I appreciate the comment and, and you are right. It's, a, it's all about measurement ultimately. Um, I know there are a lot of conversations that are occurring nationally um, amongst, um, um, you know, my peers in uh, um, with other COGS around the country related to this topic and how do we do a better job of, of providing those measurement tools in order to do this. Um, and you know we'll we'll continue to pursue that as we go forth. Um, I know there's some places like Seattle, for example, Puget Sound Regional Council, which are in the process of developing a regional equity strategy, which is basically um, it's a toolbox and um, you know for for locals to to use at their at their at their pleasure, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. I I, I, just, I thought about that when you mentioned you know that you know when you're thinking about you know at the at the local level how you you yourself can implement projects to to um to accommodate some some of these concerns that we have it it's something that maybe is worthy of, of exploration in in this region as well yeah i appreciate that i think different um industries and sectors maybe have uh a little bit more benchmarking in this area i i know in in my field we do but i haven't thought about it in the level that I probably could be in the local political level and decision making. So it's good, it's challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Olson. Okay, our next question or comment is from uh, Director Jim Gale. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> last question made me think about health impact assessments. Uh, just like EIA, there there are areas in the country that do health impact assessments that, you know, some of these can be so uh, deep dives that it's more you get more complex than you might need. But that's something that maybe MPOs should be talking to each other about and how this would apply. Uh, a small step that uh, Mayor Weinberg, Laura, has taken is she's pointed a bunch of subcommittees probably every city has this but we have one called jedi it's justice equity diversity inclusiveness a subcommittee to look at issues and see how we can improve both internally and externally and that's a, a long reach and a long long effort so i just share those thoughts with you thanks sir Thank you very much, Director Dale. Our next question or comment is from Director Elise Jones. Director Jones, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for working on this issue. I, I think a lot of us are trying to as well, and I think it's probably going to be a collective um, iterative learning process, and it would be good to sort of share lessons learned as we go along. One of the things Boulder County is trying to do is center equity in our COVID response and recovery work and to apply a racial equity lens to say um, our, how we are dispersing CARES Act funding, um, small business grants that we're trying to put out, um, and um, how we're dealing with testing and other things like that with, a, with an eye towards reducing the racial disparities that are existing in COVID impacts. And really using that as a pilot to then roll that out to looking at other policies um, and I would also note that the RTD Accountability Committee is is, use, is trying to also do, use a racial or an equity lens, including racial equity, um, to look at any recommendations that it comes up with. So I think there's a lot of um, jurisdictions and organizations that are trying to um, do this work, and uh, and I think we should sort of be intentional about sharing, um, uh, yeah, what's working and 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 what's not, and um, you know, because I think it'll, it will be a long journey. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Jones. Uh, and with that, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Again, uh, Executive Director Rex, Mr. Calvert, Mr. Papstorf, Ms. Sanchez Warren, we appreciate your efforts and time and and um, facilitating this, this important discussion. We, we, the board, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next item, uh, committee reports. Uh, report of the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Jones. 
All right. Um, so real quickly, in case you missed it, uh, in early October, Congress did a one-year extension of the Federal FAST Act, which, in case you're not familiar with that acronym, is the federal law that funds surface transportation. Um, STAC uh, received an update on CDOT's finances. CDOT's um, got a projected fiscal shortfall of about $71 million and is planning to close that through various means, including some cost savings on CDOT buildings, certificates of occupation, of participation and reduced uh, debt service obligations. We received an update on Front Range Passenger Rail from Randy Grauberger. I think a lot of you probably have seen this update, um, but if you haven't, um, they're in the process of identifying and evaluating specific um, alignments for the proposed passenger rail, um, evaluating things like cost effectiveness and feasibility, and, and they're gonna use that to eventually work their way to a NEPA analysis. Um, let's see what else. Um, received a very brief update on the Multimodal Options Fund and the projects that different areas of the state have selected for funding for that. And then last but not least, STAC is in the process of revising its bylaws and we will vote on them next meeting. Um, I think the, the most contentious uh, um, item was whether or not there should be term limits for the chair and vice chair. So stay tuned. That's all from STAC. Great. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, next report, uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison uh, messaged me to indicate there is no report. Uh, next report, report of Metro Area County Commissioners, Director or Partridge messaged me as well. Uh, no report, but they are going to meet this Friday. Uh, next report, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. Sanchez Warren, please. Well, that was quick. Um, <laughs> The advisory committee got an update on the accountable health communities. As Brad told you earlier, this program screens people in clinical settings like hospitals and, and clinics uh, for needs in the area of nutrition, transportation, housing, energy, and uh, safety, and works to provide those services once they leave those clinical settings. Um, we've been working remotely, which is very interesting. Before they were assigned to the, the, the ED units of the hospitals and in the clinics, um, and that's been uh, a, a challenging to work uh, virtually with a lot of these folks, but we've done a good job so far. We've seen over 33 or screened over 33,000 folks. Um, the number one need, not surprising, uh, before COVID was uh, uh, nutrition, and we've seen a bump in that. That still contends it used to be the number one need, followed by transportation, housing, energy, and then uh, safety. And we also got a second presentation from the Ombudsman program. Uh, the ombudsman are, are able to go back to, uh, to visit residents in, in nursing homes outside. Uh, that's been proving uh, challenging as well. Think about, you know, you have to wear a mask and they have to wear a mask and most of our clients are hard of hearing and you're outside with traffic noise and other, um, uh, other people visiting. It's, it's challenging. Um, we're not learning as much as we'd hope to learn from that. Uh, you might have heard uh, on the news there were two pretty uh, terrible uh, cases that happened in our region in nursing homes. So we're working with the health department too in, on, on those investigations uh, and uh, working to help families deal with uh, the, the uh, trauma that those, those uh, cases or uh, it's neglect in both situations. Um, uh, and both residents died and just kind of uh, telling people, you know, helping them deal with that loss as well as uh, helping them navigate uh, how to get personal belongings back and those types of things. So those were the the two uh, big reports uh, for the Aging Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Uh, the, the next item, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, real quick, three items. Um, we had an ozone season wrap up, and as you can probably guess, it wasn't the best of years for us. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that area. Um, our very own Robert Spots, uh, who's our um, mobility analytics program manager, he teamed up with a colleague from North Front Range MPO to give a kind of a one on 101 of uh, transportation conformity, and I think it was well received by the group. Uh, we also had a presentation by CEO on the greenhouse gas reduction uh, roadmap, and um, 
um, as you can imagine, with a group like that, there was quite a bit of discussion on it. So, Mr. Chairman, that is the three items that I'm going to share tonight. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, next item report from E470. In interest of time, Director Teal uh, asked me to provide this report. Uh, E470 has finished up their, their board retreat, uh, and we also had a budget workshop as well. Uh, some of the highlights uh, are traffic trend or low lights. Traffic trends are trending uh, uh, like we were in 2013. So we've, we've had significant uh, decline in traffic volume. Uh, we're down about 35 percent. Uh, the 2021 budget, we're continuing to see a, a softening of, um, of traffic volume. Uh, we anticipate that uh, it'll be 2025 by the time we get to levels that we've seen pre-COVID. Uh, we also have a capital project uh, on deck. Uh, the uh, tollway expansion from I-70 to 104th widening, that should start uh, construction in 2022-2024. So that is my report uh, for E470. Next item report of uh, from CDOT, Director White, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I can be pretty brief tonight as well. I have two, two quick um, issues of, of substance and, and a third one being more of an advertisement. Um, but uh, the issue kind of front and center for CDOT continues to be wildfires as it was last month. Uh, we uh, divide up the state into C, uh, five regions. And right now, uh, all four of the all four of the five have dealt with wildfires um, in one form or the other. So, with the exception of the immediate Denver area, um, we have been uh, tracking those closely and, and trying to make sure we have road closures in place and help communities evacuate when needed. So, um, tough season uh, for CDOT on that, but you know, more more impactful, of course, to the communities that are dealing with that. Uh, you know, the second issue I'll, I'll note, I really appreciated the discussion tonight on equity, diversity, and inclusion. CDOT is, is looking at this as well and has formed a, an internal committee um, across the department to think how we can do better in this space. And I appreciate Ron's mention of the Safer Main Streets program and the efforts we've made there to look at the way we pick those projects through an um, environmental justice lens as sort of being one of the criteria. So. I'd just like to extend a, a hand of partnership to Dr. Cog that we continue to, to brainstorm and think of ways we can work together. Um, and it's good to know we're, we're all rowing in the same direction and, and tackling this. And then the, the third and advertisement is just to, to, to say the stack is the best, uh, best seat in town. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk to any board members about about the stack and the issues we cover. I can guarantee you when we're not in a pandemic, we serve donuts and bad coffee, mm -hmm. um, but it is a, a really important group um, for the department to get a, a broad voice uh, from across the state. Uh, so that's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Director White. Uh, next item report on fast tracks. Director Van Meter, please. Thank you, Chair. A few quick updates from RTD. The operations on the end line, the grand opening of which was on September 21st, are going well. Deborah Johnson, our new general manager and CEO, her first day on the job will be Monday, November 9th. For those of you interested in pouring through RTD's 2021 budget, I'm sure you'll all go there right after this meeting. It is posted on our website and it's planned for adoption by the RTD board in November. Um, no surprise, significant declines in the budget for next year and those details again are on the RTD website. And the final item I'll talk about in a little more detail is our January 2021 upcoming service changes. We're kind of calling them the COVID-2 service changes. So the current service out on the streets is our COVID-1. COVID-2 service changes are slated for adoption by the board next Tuesday. Um, they continue the service cuts that have been talked about a little bit this evening by some of my fellow directors, um, roughly 40% from 2019 service levels, cuts in service continuing in the January 2021 service changes. Recognizing that, and, and that's directly dependent on our 
projected budget and uh, um, the budget shortfalls that we have to address there. Recognizing those issues, last night the RTD Operations Committee um, ad adopted an, an amendment to the motion to move the COVID-2 service changes and it's intended to strike a hopeful note and the wording is approximately the way I'm going to state right now. The January 2021 service changes are pandemic plan two, intended to be temporary. The cuts and changes in this plan and the original pandemic plan will be revisited by the board no later than September 2021. In the meanwhile, RTD will establish in coordination with local jurisdictions a documented process for restoring or restructuring suspended and reduced services. This process will use the January 2020 run board as a baseline, also considering the changes in transit use and lessons learned in reimagine RTD and during the pandemic. That concludes my update from RTD. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Next section of the agenda, informational items. There are two items. Uh, please feel free to review at your leisure. If you have any questions or comments on those two items, please get a hold of Mr. Calver and Mr. Cottrell. Next section is administrative items. Uh, item 15, our next meeting is November 18th. Uh, item 16, other matters by members. Uh, if there are any other matters by members, please feel free to raise your, raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody with their hands raised or their star six punched? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm browsing quickly and I am not seeing any hands raised and I don't think I hear anyone on the phones. All right, thank you. Um, for all those who are up for re-election, best of luck to you. Uh, it's only a few weeks away and with no other matters before this, uh, this board, we are adjourned at 9-11. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Be safe. Thanks. Good night, everyone.